Good, good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 12242 in the name of John Swinney on the Local Government for Scotland Order 2015. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request speak button now. And I call on John Swinney to speak to me of the motion. Deputy First Minister, about eight minutes. President Officer, today's Local Government Finance Order seeks agreement to the allocation of revenue funding to local government for 2015-16 to enable local authorities to maintain and improve the vital services on which communities across Scotland depend. It also seeks agreement to the allocation of additional funding for the current financial year since the 2014 orders were discussed and approved at this time last year. The 2015-16 Local Government Finance Settlement is a single-year settlement this is necessary as the Scottish Government can only allocate funding once we know what our budget settlements are from the United Kingdom Government and on this occasion we are only aware of our budget for the forthcoming financial year. In 2015-16, the Scottish Government will provide councils with a total funding package worth over £10.85 billion. This includes revenue funding of almost £10 billion and support for capital expenditure of over £856 million. Today's order seeks Parliament's approval for the distribution and payment of £9.8 billion out of the revenue total of almost £10 billion. The remainder will be paid out as specific grant funding for which separate legislation already exists and other funding will be distributed later. I will bring a second order before Parliament once councils have set their 2015-16 budgets to pay the £70 million to compensate all councils that freeze their council tax again in 2015-16 for the eighth consecutive year. I will use the second order to distribute the funding for the discretionary housing payments amounting to £35 million for next year, which will enable this Government to fully mitigate the effects of the UK Government's bedroom tax and any other changes that may be required. I advised Parliament yesterday in the Budget debate about the approach the Government is taking about the number of teachers employed in our schools. The Government has been clear and consistent in our commitment to maintain teacher numbers in line with pupil numbers as a central part of our priority to raise attainment. Over the period 2011-12 to 2014-15, we have provided additional funding of £134 million to local authorities specifically to support them in maintaining teacher numbers. As I explained yesterday, despite specific and sufficient funding being made available to maintain the employment of teachers, the number of teachers declined slightly last year and the ratio of pupils to teachers rose slightly into the bargain. In discussion with COSLA, I have offered to suspend the penalty for 2014-15 that I was entitled to apply as a result of the fall in teacher numbers, as well as to provide a further £10 million next year on top of the previously allocated £41 million to support the employment of teachers. £10 million is in fact the amount put to me as necessary by the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities to deliver this commitment. At this stage, COSLA has been unable to agree to what I consider to be a fair and a generous offer of government support to deliver a good outcome for our education system. As a result, the government feels it has no alternative but to make that funding available on a council-by-council -council basis um, if and only if councils are prepared to sign up to a clear commitment to protect teacher numbers. Individuals, uh, individual councils who share our ambition to maintain teacher numbers will have access to a share of the planned £41 million and of the further £10 million to help them deliver on their commitment. However, a failure to deliver will result in a clawback of funding. The most important changes to the figures I announced in December is the distribution of the £343 million in respect of the Council Tax Reduction Scheme. The only addition to the total figure is the £869,000 resulting from the Government's decision to bring forward legislation to ensure that local authorities can take no further action to recover ancient community charge or poll tax debts. The 2015 order also seeks approval for the changes to the net increase of £146.5 million in 2014-15 funding allocations that was either held back from the 2014 order or has been added to fund a number of agreed spending commitments which have arisen since the 2014 order was approved. These include £68.6 million representing the agreed 20% holdback for the Council Tax Reduction Scheme, £27.5 million for the Teachers Induction Scheme, £16.5 million for the Free School Meals in Primary 1-3 to policy, £15 million for looked-after children, £12 million for discretionary housing payments, 
5 million for the National Teachers Qualifications Policy and 3.5 million pounds for workforce development resulting from the Children and Young People Act 2014. I should also explain that the total revenue funding to be paid out to councils but not included in this order in 2015-16 includes £86.5 million paid to, uh, directly to criminal justice authorities, uh, £70 million to fund the council tax freeze, £35 million for discretionary housing payments and £27.6 million for the teachers' induction scheme. The £70 million to fund the council tax freeze will be added to the individual local authority settlements totals which I bring forward uh, when I bring forward the local government amendment order for those councils who have budgeted to freeze the council tax in 2015-16. Presiding officer, you will be aware that my budget bill statement yesterday included changes that will impact on the 2015-16 funding, both on the total local government financial settlement and the distribution of the figures included in the local government finance order under discussion today. As a result of our decision to match the UK Government's cap on business rates poundage, um, the increase will be limited to 2%, which reduces our business rates income by £11 million. But as I explained yesterday, I have allocated a compensating amount from the associated Barnet consequentials to match this reduction in income. What this means in practical effect is that I will reduce the distributable non-domestic rates amount by £11 million in the amendment order and increase the general revenue grant total by the same amount. The redistribution of these sums will ensure that all 32 local authorities receive exactly the same total funding as set out in the order before Parliament today. Although not part of today's order, the overall package for local authorities includes support for capital funding in 2015-16 of over £856 million, delivering on our commitment to maintain local government's share of the overall capital budget. Presiding officer, I now turn to the issue of business rates and our continuing delivery of the most competitive business tax environment in the United Kingdom. For example, support under our small business bonus scheme is at a record high, with over 96,000 business properties now benefiting. In December, I confirmed that we will continue to match the English poundage rates for 2015-16, um, and that reaffirms the Government's commitments to maintaining the competitive advantage enjoyed by Scottish businesses since 2007. Our extensive package of business rates relief also con continues, worth around £618 million in the forthcoming financial year, offering enduring support for Scottish businesses. And our Community Empowerment Bill proposes the power for councils to offer further rates reliefs in their local authority areas if they choose to do so. As confirmed previously, the Public Health Supplement will conclude at the end of this financial year. Looking ahead, we will continue to use the time before the 2017 revaluation to make further improvements to the business rates framework based on our 20-point action plan and our current consultation on the appeal system and responding to the important feedback that we receive from ratepayers. Rate In summary, presiding officer, the total funding from the Scottish Government to local authorities next year amounts to over £10.85 billion. Uh, with that in mind, I move that Parliament agrees to the Local Government Finance Scotland Order 2015. Thank you. I now call Jackie Bailey. Ms Bailey, about six minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Local government is, of course, key to delivering social justice and tackling inequality. And if we care about preventative action, and I believe we do across this chamber, then the services provided by local government, such as education, such as social care, absolutely need investment. Yet this is probably the only major spending portfolio to experience a real cash cut in their budget. In 2010-11, local government received 38% of the Scottish Government budget. Today, it is 32%. That's 6% less, and members will have heard me before explain that that equates to a £1.8 billion of a cut if it was to be applied today. Indeed, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation said that local government spending in Scotland will have fallen by 24% in real terms this year. Now, I know John Swinney is a master at spinning figures, but, you know, transparency suffers as a consequence. He tells us that local government share is increasing. He certainly did during the discussion on the budget. What he doesn't do is include the whole budget, and he still counts in the resources for fire and police that were actually transferred out two years ago. Spice confirmed that, contrary to what the Cabinet Secretary claims, local government share has indeed fallen. Joseph Rowntree tells us there's a cut. 
Local government tells us there's a cut. Unison tell us there's a cut. Only John Swinney pretends that there isn't. And make no mistake, the cuts that the SNP have presided over aren't just austerity. This is austerity plus from the SNP Edinburgh government. In October, the Cabinet Secretary wrote to every council to tell them that the Scottish Government had experienced cuts of 10% from the UK Government, and that was absolutely accurate. But if you take his assumptions and apply them to local government, what he didn't tell them was the scale of the cut that he would be passing on to them would be even greater still. In Renfrewshire, the cut is 17%. Edinburgh, the cut is 20%. Western Bartonshire, is 22%. Local authorities in every part of Scotland have received austerity plus even more cuts from the SNP. Let me turn to the question of teacher numbers. There are 4,275 fewer teachers in Scotland because of the SNP. They committed to maintaining teacher numbers. So this is a considerable failure on their part. Now, John Swinney is only now attempting to put a sticking plaster on that failure and concedes, as his starting point, a worsening of the teacher-pupil ratio and a reduction in teacher numbers. That strikes me as an incredible lack of ambition for Scotland's parents and children. Labour is committed to maintaining teacher numbers, but Mr Swinney needs to give education enough money to do so. And I think he fundamentally makes a mistake in playing politics with this issue. Let me remind him of Renfrewshire Council when it was run by the SNP under the control of none other than Derek Mackay, former local government minister. I don't see him in the chamber today. Teacher numbers when he took over in the council in 2007 were 1,853. When Labour took control five years later, they inherited 1,598 teachers. The SNP and Derek Mackay had removed 255 teachers from local schools. Since then, Labour in Renfrewshire haven't just maintained teacher numbers, but they've actually managed to increase them, albeit marginally. So actions do speak louder than words, and it's clear that in this case, the SNP in local government, as well as the SNP in the Edinburgh government, are cutting teacher numbers. If we are agreed that we want to maintain teacher numbers, and we are agreed on that point, then we need to make sure that there are sufficient resources to do so. Faced with an average of a 20% reduction in their budget, the scale of the response from the Scottish Government needs to reflect the challenge experienced by local government. Can I touch on discretionary housing payments? Because I'm conscious that they've been reduced by the UK Government for this coming year. They will, in effect, be less available for local authorities to help some of the most disadvantaged people in our communities. Now, I always listen very carefully to what the Cabinet Secretary has to say. He said that the Scottish Government's position is to provide sufficient funds for the full mitigation of the bedroom tax. Whilst I don't believe we should constantly be making up for the proposition put to us by the Conservative and Liberal Democrat government, he did speak about the full mitigation and therefore there is a shortfall in funding to some of our most hard-pressed local authorities to help the most disadvantaged in our communities. I would be interested to hear if his intention is to provide additional resource to actually ensure that we do help those local authorities and those people across Scotland that need that assistance. I think we are also in agreement, presiding officer, as I draw to a close, that there is a structural problem with the financing of local government. So I very much welcome the Cross-Party Commission on Local Government Funding. But there is an urgency to help now. And whilst we will vote in favour of the order this evening, we do so in recognition that the amount available to local authorities is in substantial decline, and that position does need to be reversed. Thank you. I now call on Cameron Buchanan. Four minutes, Mr Buchanan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Scottish Government's budget was approved yesterday, it is of course welcome that this order regarding the money to be distributed to local government is before Parliament. It is important that all members and the public are kept well informed of local government finance orders, particularly because every detail matters to the communities that Scotland's councils serve. 
I imagine that all members present are aware of the financial difficulty facing many local authorities at the moment, which heightens the importance that Parliament debates local government policy at length. On this point, the debate gives us the chance to consider some of the ongoing issues related to local authorities' finances and how their relationship with the Scottish Government is influencing them. It is very important that we give some context to this debate about the local government finance order, because ultimately what matters is what the public get from their local authority. With this in mind, the financial situation at the City of Edinburgh Council is an example worth considering. They are presently needing to find 138 million worth of savings in their budget for 2017. They have consulted the city residents to gauge which services are considered essential, in which they may have funding withdrawn. I therefore wonder why the City of Edinburgh's funding has been reduced on a like-for-like -like basis from 746 million to 739 million. I will welcome a clarification on this. This seems to be the only council that's had its funding reduced. I will not go into the detail of the council's decisions, which are a matter for them. But what I will say is that this situation is not unique in Scotland, and this Parliament would, would do well to consider such a context throughout consideration of the funding being provided by the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government and local authorities do, in my opinion, have a duty to be as transparent as possible regarding financial choices, and the need to ensure that these decisions are made on, a, on spending are clear for all to see. Councils, as well as central government, must be accountable to the taxpayers. Having said this, responsibility does apply both ways, in particular to those who owe tax to councils and should have to, they should have to pay it. Councils depend on this to be able to fund the services that local residents need. However, this government is planning to remove the debt that local authorities are owed and offers compensation only a tiny settlement that completely ignores the potential knock-on effects regarding future tax payments to local authorities. When councils are facing substantial budget difficulties, this government is choosing to support people who have avoided paying their ta tax. Hard-working taxpayers should not be forced to subsidise other people's tax avoidance and local authorities should not be left to suffer the financial consequences when people avoid paying tax if they expect their debt to be cancelled by a future government. This is a context that we cannot ignore whilst considering this order before us. Finally, I would like to use this opportunity to redraw attention to the crucial aspect of local government policy, which is exactly how local, local authorities are funded. In previous debates, we have discussed how there is a broad agreement that the present model of council funding through council tax, Scottish Government grants, fees, business rates and other income needs to change. As yet, a crucial decision on how to reform this has not been reached, but I would like to emphasise my hope that a sensible and fair solution can be reached. Accordingly, Presiding Officer, I would like to express my hope that when it comes to local government, the Parliament continues to focus on the real issues affecting councils every day. With this in mind, it is within the context of pressing financial difficulties exacerbated by this government's policy on community charge debt that we should consider the order before us, as well as any future reviews of how local government is financed. We will, however, be supporting the motion this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Buchanan. We now move to a very short open debate. Uh, speech is four minutes. Kevin Stewart, followed by Alex Rowley. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, and I'm glad that we can uh, debate this local government finance order uh, this afternoon. Uh, and I'm extremely pleased that uh, we will see the council tax freeze for the eighth uh, consecutive years, uh, which will uh, give the average household a saving over the period of 2008 to 15, uh, 900 pounds uh, in their pocket. And I think that that will be welcomed uh, in households uh, across Scotland. Beyond that, presiding officer, uh, we are seeing once again uh, delivery of the most competitive business environment uh, in uh, the UK. Uh, and 96,000 businesses throughout the country uh, will benefit from the small business bonus. And I have to say, uh, presiding officer, uh, that compared to our counterparts in England and Wales, uh, Scottish local government uh, is doing quite well. Uh, where uh, the difference lies is we are seeing drastic cuts uh, south of the border. Meanwhile, here uh, in Scotland, uh, while the Scottish uh, budget has risen by 6.4% uh, since 2007-8, uh, local government's share of that budget from the Scottish Government has increased by 8.9%. Yesterday, um, presiding officer, 
uh, we saw the Labour Party uh, vote against £330 million for thir further investment in schools for the future. We saw them vote against extending uh, childcare uh, for all three and four-year-olds and vulnerable two-year-olds. We saw them vote against the council tax freeze and we saw them vote against uh, the most competitive business tax regime uh, in the UK. And what I've heard since that budget uh, uh, vote yesterday um, is a number of Labour politicians uh, taking to social media uh, and to the newspapers uh, saying that they, uh, w w they will have a war about teacher numbers. A war about teacher numbers. What I would say is that the money to hold these teacher numbers is being provided. All that councils need to do is to spend that money to ensure that those teacher numbers are maintained. And if there is a war and they choose uh, not uh, to do this, then that war will be on teachers, on pupils and parents. And that is what bothers my constituents, including the parents at Broom Hill School, who have been on at me sorry, uh, this Grant, week no about teacher numbers. Uh, it concerns parents uh, across this country. So in, instead of talking about a war over teacher numbers, I would suggest that councils, the length and breadth of the country, should take the money from Mr Swinney and ensure that that money is spent on maintaining teacher numbers across this nation. Um, Presiding officer, um, I am pleased uh, to see once again uh, that Aberdeen is going to benefit uh, from this settlement with an extra £10 million in the next financial year. Um, I, I'm always a little bit parochial uh, in these regards. There is always something that I say during the course of these debates, presiding officer, and uh, that is an appeal not to the Cabinet Secretary, but to COSLA, to have a, a look at the local government funding formula because um, uh, I do think that a change to that would benefit Aberdeen and the northeast of Scotland even more. Uh, and with that, presiding officer, uh, I'd like to thank you, and I'll be supporting this order today. Alex Rowley, followed by Alice McInnes. Presiding officer, I think um, the chairman of the local government committee's comments are so far removed from reality that, that to be honest, I wouldn't want to waste any of my four minutes' time actually speaking about them. Um, could I say that yesterday I was really disappointed uh, when, when the Deputy First Minister, John Swinney, decided to turn this into a political argument with local government. And I think, as I spoke to local council leaders today, they are equally disappointed um, in terms of moving forward. One of the concerns, it's an important one, that I hope the, the, the Minister or, the, or, or, or the, the, the Deputy First Minister will, will address, is that, that, firstly, at that COSLA meeting last week, and I find this out today, there was 12 out of the 28 council leaders that were Labour leaders, so this was not simply Labour and local government, it was across um, all, all parties of local government that there was genuine concerns, but one of the genuine concerns, that, as I understand it, they wanted to discuss with Mr Swinney was their ability to actually be able to meet these numbers in terms of teacher recruitment. Now, I've spoke to, to my colleagues in Fife this morning. We had the, the situation of another council up in the North East uh, last week. was a, was a um, Angus. It was one of the councils where, where, where they were taught about having to send pupils home because of the problem with recruitment numbers. And, and I'm told that in Leavemouth and Fife, they have a major problem right now. And the Director of Education in Fife is advising Fife Council that they have a major problem in a number of areas being able to recruit teachers. And, you know, when I ask council leaders what is the issue with that they tell me well the Scottish Government have, have, have got wrong in terms of their preparation and the fact that they have a national planning process in place and so the failure of the, the Scottish Government to plan properly could, in Mr Swinney's words, result in councils being penalised and money is taking off them that needs to go into education. So I think he needs to address that issue and he does need to talk to councils. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that council leaders and council education spokespersons right across Scotland will be contacting Mr Swinney and will be having meetings with them. I'm certainly asking them to publish all the figures that they have on teachers, on the education budgets, because right across Scotland, 
we are seeing major, major cuts taking place in, 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 in education budgets. The big issue I have with John Swinney's budget, I have to say, is that, that the failure to look at joined up. One of the things, one of the, the reports and one of the strategies that Mr Swinney has been pushing and pushing over a number of times was that to come from the Christie Commission. And the Christie Commission talked about the need to actually change the way that we deliver public services. It talked about the need to look at investment and look at investment in prevention. And yet, his budget really fails to really come on to that because local government has to be at surely the front line. Local government is the front line in terms of tackling inequality and tackling poverty. But as Audit Scotland and Unison point out, that the, the types of cuts that are taking place means that there is, there is more pressure and less opportunity. They say that, that the 50, 000, what, four out of five of the 50,000 job cuts in the public sector are from local government with many more in the pipeline. Services have been salami sliced, increasing pressures on remaining Members staff to minute. deliver services with fewer resources. They point out that if you're going to tackle inequality and poverty, then you need to be in communities at the heart of communities, putting in place programmes, training skills, getting people the opportunities to get jobs, because it is jobs and skills that close, will please. tackle poverty and inequality. So I have to say, and as I finish, President, Officer, um, by a comment that was made to me this morning by the Deputy Leader of Fife Council. She said to me, we have a STEM strategy in place because we recognise that we need to do more in terms of getting young people finish, opportunities please. for jobs. What's the point of having a STEM strategy if we can't recruit the teachers in mathematics and other areas to be able to do that? Right. That is the real problem, and I hope Mr Swinney will address it and go back and speak to local authorities point and apologise apologise now for politicising this Swinney issue. To wind up the debate, please. Oh, I beg your pardon. Alison McInnes. Four minutes, please, up to... OK, thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. On Tuesday, I asked that Fergus Ewing why Aberdeen City uh, Council's funding allocation was below the funding floor. And he just recited the script of the Finance Minister over the last three years, that they made an adjustment three years ago and nothing more needs to happen. And I've had to listen to John Swinney say in this chamber that it was very important to him not to look again at the settlement for the last three years. Well, that complacency and neglect completely ignores the situation with the North Sea oil and gas industry, which has changed in the last three years. It simply doesn't help us react to decisive shifts in the economy. All of the emergency meetings, the renewed strategies, the summit meeting, they're supposed to show how serious we all are about oil and gas in the northeast of Scotland. They were supposed to get action. But the Scottish Government lets the region down with its failure to meet its promise on City Council funding. In the North East, our local economy is of national importance. We have a council in Aberdeen with important work to do to help the industry that drives that economy. There is no recognition in this settlement of the work that needs to be done by our partners in Aberdeen City. We showed in December that the city was shortchanged. And we look at the figures today and it's 16 million. Shortchanged by 16 million by the government's plans today. The Scottish Government should admit today that that's the case. The promise of a funding floor has not been met. Aberdeen was promised at least 85% of the national average, and we haven't got it. SNP ministers and their MSP supporters boasted about that funding floor. Maureen Watt even put it on her website. Now she's a minister, and she's voting for less than 85%. For Aberdeen, the funding hasn't followed the flannel. The funding floor simply doesn't exist. And in this year, of all years, Aberdeen City needs decisive commitment from this government, and yet we're not going to get it today. Many thanks. I now call on Mr Swinney to wind up. Mr Swinney, uh, four minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, let me address the, the last point that Alison McInnes has raised, because uh, the, the point is uh, raised frequently. And I'll also... In answering Alison McInnes's point, I'll also answer Mr Buchanan's point about the City of Edinburgh, because the two points are linked. When the government, I might point out, the first became the first government yeah. ever in Scotland to do anything to tackle the underfunding of Aberdeen City Council. When we became the first government ever to do anything about that, we introduced an 85% flow. And of course, I'll give way to Alison. Thank you very much, Mr Swinney. I have the figures here, your own figures here. Um, 
The research from SPICE has shown time and time again that Aberdeen was above the floor. We didn't need an 85% floor because it was always above in the, the years that we were in, in, in uh, government, year on year. Mr Swinney. Uh, the, 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 the problem for Alison McInnes is that uh, the issue of the, uh, the difference in funding for Aberdeen City Council versus the Scottish average has been a persistent problem, which I'm afraid to say her government did absolutely nothing to resolve. And we were the first ones to resolve it. And this year, in, this finan in the forthcoming financial year, if I had done nothing about this issue, if I had done nothing about this issue, Aberdeen City Council would not be getting, in the forthcoming financial year, £11.3 million. And the reason why Aberdeen City Council is getting that uh, extra sum of money is because the amount of money that's going to Edinburgh falls because of the changes in the distribution formula. So Edinburgh last year, for example, out of the 85% flow money, got £22.9 and that will now be £13.7 million, which answers Mr Buchanan's point. So all I'd say to Alison McInnes is that uh, it would be nice if she welcomed the fact that the Scottish Government had actually acted to address the funding situation in Aberdeen, which was such a campaigning priority of my late colleague uh, Brian Adam. Now, uh, Jackie Bailey um, raised the issue about uh, the uh, share of local government funding and the pattern of local government funding, and Alec Rowley uh, made his contribution about that into the bargain. Jackie Bailey's contribution, Alec Rowley's contribution, I would take more seriously if they'd come to the budget proposals yesterday and offered some more money for local government. But they didn't. Jackie Bailey came here, and all our colleagues came here, and they told me they were going to be so good this year, they weren't going to have a big shopping list of all the things they normally come here with, and they were incredibly disciplined, and they came here, well, apart of that, well, they managed it until the last stages of the debate, when the, the list, which was just to be only about health, actually became about health, local government, and colleges. But if I give them the benefit of the doubt and say that the only thing they came here in the budget process to demand was more money for health, then they shoot their argument in the foot by saying that there should have been more money for local government. Right. Because what they're arguing here today, Thursday, it's just a day late, it's just an afternoon, it's not even 24 hours after we voted on the budget. And they're here asking for more money for local government, which they didn't bring forward to Parliament. Of course I'll give way to Mr. Mike Riley. What we're here arguing for today is more teachers for local government. Do you accept that there is not enough teachers and that you've got the planning wrong and local authorities across Scotland in many areas are struggling to find teachers? In well, your last what, minute, what, please. I, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm actually bringing... Well, what I did yesterday was I brought forward an announcement that £10 million of extra... £10 million of extra money would be available to fund teacher posts. And where did that figure of £10 million come from? I didn't dream it up. That was the figure put to me by the Convention of Scottish Local yeah. Authorities. And I thought, being a reasonable man, if I offered to pay that £10 million, I might get an agreement from the Convention of yeah. Scottish Local Authorities, which I was unable to get. Now, I went through yesterday, carefully with Parliament, my regret at the fact I was unable to get a deal with local government. Because the reason why we've uh, worked so hard over the years to get agreements is because local government has been very fairly treated in the financial arrangements of the Scottish Government. The Labour Party support us on what we've done on health expenditure. In fact, they would like us to go further. That was their position yesterday. They would like us to go further. And if we take the, local, the, the health uh, funding tools, out of the please. equation, I will do, President Officer, the local government share of the total budget available to the Scottish Government is going up under this administration when we take health into account. And what about teachers, Mr Rowley shouts? Teachers, I'm putting £10 million into the settlement to support the funding of teachers. And if Mr Rowley, rather than shouting at me from a sedentary position, which is most unlike him, it's normally reserved to Jackie Bailey that does that sort of thing, I would encourage Mr Rowley to do something constructive and encourage his local authority colleagues to yeah, accept the yeah. deal that I've offered. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, and that concludes the debate on the Local Government Finance Scotland Order 2015. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12241 in the name of Alex Neil on working in partnership to end the practice of female genital mutilation. I'd invite members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Cabinet Secretary, if and when you are ready, you have 13 minutes or thereby.
please. Very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. I, on behalf of the Scottish Government, I'm pleased to open this debate on this very important issue, working in partnership to end the practice of female genital mutilation. The Scottish Government considers female genital mutilation to be an unacceptable and, of course, it's an illegal practice, a form of child abuse and violence against women and a violation of the human rights of women and girls. It is a specific form of violence under the guise of culture and religion and there is no place in the Scotland we all want to create. It is gender-based in its nature and, as you will know, is often closely linked to other forms of violence against women and girls, such as forced marriage, which became a criminal offence at the end of September last year. It reflects deep-rooted inequality between the sexes and constitutes an extreme form of discrimination against women. It is nearly always carried out on minors. The World Health Organization estimates that between 120 million and 140 million women from 29 countries worldwide have been affected by FGM and that every year another 3 million girls become at risk of the procedure which partially or wholly removes or injures their gen genitalia for non-medical reasons. So what about Scotland? The Scottish Refugee Council's report tackling FGM in Scotland, a Scottish model of intervention, launched last December and funded by the Scottish Government to the tune of more than £20,000, goes some considerable way to achieving an understanding of the scale of the issue in Scotland and to identify how, by working collaboratively, we can prevent and hopefully eradicate it. This report has adopted a well-rounded approach to the gathering of data to identify populations potentially affected by female genital mutilation in Scotland, with figures indicating that between 2001 and 2012, just under 3,000 girls were born in Scotland to mothers from FGM practicing countries. Presiding officer, this debate is timely, coming as it does the day before the International Day of Zero, Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation, a day when the world will take a stand against child torture, the heinous physical abuse of women, and a practice that has no place in society, yet unfortunately still affects far too many across the globe today. Last week, I was able to hear it firsthand about the important work of London-based FGM organisations such as Equality Now in tackling FGM across the UK. And indeed, I'm delighted to show a commitment here in Scotland to tackling FGM by announcing that there will be a launch tomorrow by the Women's Support Project of the Scottish Government-funded Awareness Raising Materials. My colleague, the Minister for Housing and Welfare, will be attending the launch. And can I say in passing also, in the discussions with Equality Now, I think that we can and we agreed to share good practice across the UK because we are doing some things in this field that they are not doing, but now we'd like to consider, and vice versa. The Scottish Government has provided almost £50,000 funding to the Women's Support Project to develop a range of materials, including one, a Scottish DVD outlining the law child protection, prevention work in communities, and services for women and girls who have experienced FGM. Secondly, information leaflets for practitioners, highlighting key points, good practice resources and services, and a standardized training package and risk assessment tool. And thirdly, an FGM statement that sets out the law in relation to FGM in Scotland, which individuals can show to family, friends, and or relatives when travelling abroad to remind them that FGM is a serious offence in Scotland and in the UK and that there are severe penalties for practising it. Raising awareness and promoting understanding is absolutely vital in addressing the complex issues of FGM and I welcome this launch and the focus it brings to this important issue. Presiding officer, the debate this afternoon provides the opportunity to do two things. One, to highlight the excellent work being done across Scotland working with our partners, and secondly, 
to set out to members our proposals for tackling FGM in the coming year within those communities potentially affected by this practice. I want to pay tribute to the wide range of third sector organisations who continue to campaign against FGM and to provide specialist support services, such as DARF, who I visited this morning, and are doing excellent work with very minimal resources. Roshni, Scottish Refugee Council, Sahilia, and of course, Women's, the Women's Support Project. Their campaigning over many years has helped to raise awareness of and influence and shape our understanding of the practice of FGM. I would like to take a moment to reflect on what has been accomplished over the last year. Between 2012 and 2015, 34 and a half million pounds has been allocated to tackle violence against women, including FGM. And in the last year, the Scottish Government has funded over 140,000 pounds directly towards work to tackle FGM. This compares very favourably with the £370,000 the UK Government has committed to a community engagement initiative and to community projects across England to help end FGM and honour-based violence, including forced marriage. Colleagues in Education Scotland, working with partners and Education Authority staff, have produced a learning resource which authorities and head teachers can use to raise awareness of FGM in schools and in early years setting. Last May, we published updated national guidance for child protection used by all children's services in Scotland, providing advice on how to respond if there are concerns that a child may have been subject to or may be at risk from FGM. Police colleagues have produced honour-based violence forced marriage and female genital mutilation standard operating procedures to provide all officers with the necessary understanding and skills to deal appropriately and consistently with honour-based violence incidents. Equally important is the need to work with communities in all areas of intervention. And one of the points driven home to me in my visit this morning to DAF is the need to work with communities not to tackle this as purely a criminal justice issue, but actually to work with communities and give them the enablement and the facilities and the support to be able to change attitudes and culture to this issue from within communities rather than being handed down from people in authority like ourselves. In terms of our next steps, following on from the Scottish Refugee Council report, we will be exploring how we can take forward these interventions under the five Ps. Policy, prevention, protection, provision and participation. By having a baseline of Scotland-specific data, we can ensure that what we're doing in Scotland to tackle FGM is right for our communities here. Our work in relation to these interventions will be facilitated by the multi-agency FGM Short Life Working Group on which the Scottish Refugee Council, amongst other key stakeholders from both the statutory and third sector, are represented. The group, which will report later this year, will make recommendations on the best way forward to prevent and eradicate FGM, aligned with the Scottish Government's policy to prevent and eradicate violence against women and girls, as set out in the equally safe document published in June last year. It will, it will ensure that what we do nationally is informed by expert opinion in relation to the overarching themes of the SRC report. If we are to banish FGM to history, we need to understand why practice, practicing communities sustain traditions that are so unacceptable, and therefore how we discuss FGM is important. The practice must not be tolerated, but equally, we must be conscious of how we engage with minority communities on these sensitive issues. Standing up to FGM in Scotland is about much more than what's in the statute book. We have to build capacity to engage with communities potentially affected and to raise awareness among those who work with, but who may not belong to, these communities. We need to work with organisations such as DARF to support engagement with affected communities, to educate people about the realities of FGM and the law in Scotland, 
and to tackle the pressures that many women in practicing communities face. And I was delighted, as I said, to meet with DAF this morning because those pressures are very often from the most immediate family members, which makes it much more difficult to resist those pressures. And of course, one of the areas that we are uh, supporting in terms of raising awareness is, as the motion calls, at the Girls Summit in July uh, this year, uh, which in fact is the invitations for which I think have just got out today uh, from international, from Glasgow City Council uh, and from UNICEF. And that will be held on the 9th of March 2015 uh, in Glasgow. And the theme is Ending Violence Against Women where both Lord McConnell, former First Minister, and Nicola Sturgeon, the current First Minister, will both be speaking, along with the Lord Provost, and giving their support to this campaign and these policies. Child and early forced marriage and FGM will also be part of that, uh, will both be part of that event uh, in March. Before I conclude, Presiding Officer, can I say that the Government will vote for Ken McIntosh's amendment uh, this afternoon, because I do think it's important that we try to speak with one voice on this issue in the Parliament. In doing so, and recognising that it does say in the amendment that we're disappointed there have been so few prosecutions, I can update the Chamber that since the 1st of April 2013, when Police Scotland became operational, there have been 23 referrals of child welfare concerns made to the police from partner agencies about FGM, which initiated an interagency referral discussion for 25 girls. In all 23 cases, the referrals related to concerns that girls were at risk of having FGM performed on them. These concerns have been fully investigated and no criminality found. Cutting had not taken place in any of the cases referred and all referrals have now been fully investigated uh, and therefore no criminality was found. So by supporting the amendment, I don't want to give the impression that we are being critical of the police. I think the work that Police Scotland is doing in this area is very helpful indeed, and indeed almost revolutionary in terms of what went before and what happens in other jurisdictions. So in conclusion, presiding, of, of, uh, presiding officer, all that I've outlined is intended to strengthen our response to FGM and to complement measures that are already in place. Those measures include working closely with police, health professionals, social work and education to share good practice and promote awareness of the prevention of FGM, continuing our support to voluntary organisations that provide support to victims of FGM, and most importantly of all, engaging with people from potentially affected communities. Without that genuine and effective commitment to the participated, participation of affected communities in working on this issue, we would fail to understand the true levels of potential risk faced by women and girls in Scotland today. And we, if we don't work with the communities, risk further marginalisation of the community voices that are the most effective advocates for change. Presiding officer, the desire, drive and determination to rid our society of this intolerable act of violence against women and girls has united and does unite this parliament and together with our shareholders, I, stakeholders, I believe we are making a difference. It's only by working together that we'll be able to achieve our goal of eradicating the scourge of FGM in our communities and in that spirit, I move the motion in my name. Many thanks. Now I call on Ken McIntosh to speak to and move Amendment 12241.1. Mr McIntosh, you have nine minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by uh, thanking the Cabinet Secretary for introducing today's motion and for giving the Parliament uh, this opportunity to mark the International Day of Zero Tolerance of Female Genital Mutilation. It is right uh, for us all in this chamber, for all Scots, to speak up against this brutal and barbaric child abuse to ensure that we tackle FGM as we would all forms of violence against women and girls, to try and change behaviour, but to do so while sending out a clear and strong message that this is a criminal act that will merit severe punishment. Just this week, 
We discovered that one in three people in the UK do not fully understand the term female genital mutilation, with one in five young people admitting they had never heard of it. Whether it is called cutting or, as previously, female circumcision, FGM can lead to infection, abscesses, infertility, physical and emotional trauma, and even death. Our levels of ignorance may be worryingly high, but it has been estimated that up to 125 million, million women and girls, mainly in pockets of the Middle East and Africa, are currently affected by this painful and violent abuse of their bodies and of their rights. What is perhaps less clear is how many women and children uh, living in Scotland are affected or at risk. It's thought the figure could be as high as 3,000. At the very least, we need to give this vulnerable group the voice they desperately need. And I'm pleased that on all sides of the chamber, we can stand united today in condemnation and in offering what we can in terms of prevention and protection. I believe we should welcome the multi-agency approach we are now seeing and the difference I'm sure we will hope that will make in raising awareness. One of the difficulties, of course, is that so few women are willing to talk about the issue, let alone report it. But the NSPCC have shared with us some of the information that has emerged from their helpline and support services. Many of the young girls who contacted Childline, for example, said that they were exposed to FGM when they were abroad. And they said they felt deceived by their own parents who made the arrangements. They said that if they had known why they were being sent on such a trip, they would have tried to prevent such a painful and distressing procedure. But they also said they felt powerless to stop it in the face of their family's cultural beliefs. In most cases, these young girls then lived with the pain and upset, not even going to the doctor for fear of getting their own parents into trouble. Presiding officer, we're talking about girls of school age, more often than not, refugees to Scotland, potentially socially isolated, and therefore not in a position to challenge the brutality of this abuse, coping by themselves with unimaginable and horrific injuries. They are told by their communities that these procedures are not only religiously, culturally and socially acceptable, but that they are necessary and will make them more marriageable by discouraging promiscuity. Presenting officer, we support the Scottish Government's commitment to removing this behaviour from our society and in ensuring FGM is treated as the criminal act it is. However, we recognise, and I'm sure the Minister uh, also does, that despite their best efforts, uh, there have been so far very few prosecutions. And uh, I was in a quote last year, there were 14 possible cases, but um, I'm pleased the Minister has updated us and 23 referrals and 25 girls uh, identified as potentially at risk. But with no prosecutions made, we know that health professionals, teachers and the police face a very tough challenge in gaining the appropriate evidence to prove when girls and women are at risk. In June last year, whilst giving evidence to the Equal Opportunities Committee, and when asked if they felt they had enough resources to tackle female genital mutilation in Scotland, Police Scotland said that they did not understand the problem and the extent of FGM in Scotland, and that until they increase the level of reporting and fully understand the prevalence of female genital mutilation in our society, it would be difficult to assess whether they had sufficient resources. And that's why uh, Labour's addendum to the motion today calls on the Scottish Government to review its investment to ensure it is effective. And can I just assure the Minister and the Member for giving way uh, that it is certainly not intended to be critical of the police, far from it. It, it is uh, aimed at working towards supporting long-term sustainable community development in at-risk communities. Yes, Mr Allard. Christian yes. Allard. I thank the member for, for taking the intervention. Uh, just to provide some information, uh, I'm a member of the Equal Opportunity Committee, and when we took that evidence, uh, I think you missed the last sentence when you said that uh, at, uh, at present, the, the, the funds are, are sufficient. But of course, if we needed to do a lot more, we will need more money. But at present, the, the, the funds are sufficient. Okay, nice Absolutely. And, and in fact, it leads me on nicely because there has been work done even since then. And uh, I think we need to build on the excellent work of the Scottish Refugee Council and others in assessing the extent of FGM in Scotland in identifying the at-risk communities. The SRC estimate, for example, that in 2011 there were just under 24,000 men, women and children living in Scotland who were born in one of the 29 countries identified by UNICEF as FGM practising or FGM affected countries. The largest community potentially affected by FGM in Scotland are the 9,500 Nigerians living here. Now, in order to truly eradicate FGM from Scotland, 
We need to work with community leaders, with educators, with young men as well as with uh, women, with religious and cultural leaders throughout the country, and to strengthen all forms of engagement with these at-risk communities. In, in fact, one-off engagement events or consultations are important uh, in terms of informing communities about health uh, services and so on. But the key to long-term change is to support and resource proper community development, building up sustainable relationships based on trust. Now, there is strong support, too, for the SRC finding that this work sits clearly under equally safe, that is, within the work to address gender-based violence against women and girls. Like other forms of violence against women, such as forced marriage and honour-based violence, which the Cabinet Secretary outlined, our criminal justice system needs to recognise this approach and ensure investigations are focused on the victims. There has been good work going on in the rest of the UK too, which again the Cabinet Secretary uh, uh, nodded and alluded to, but which we could learn from. Those include, for example, efforts to support women-only health clinics, to, support a, to provide a supportive environment in which those affected or at risk may come forward and seek help. The SRC have made a number of recommendations which I hope the Minister will be responding to. For example, to provide clear national direction on the role of frontline professionals in the prevention of FGM. The SRC suggests the relevant professional bodies and agencies should develop training on FGM for all frontline staff, including GPs, maternity services and schools. And I think the Minister referred to some of that in his opening remarks. And they go on to recommend that both statutory and voluntary agencies developing training and guidance for, for professionals should use and value the expertise of specialist NGOs. Now, my Labour colleagues and I were unsure about one particular conclusion, that a girl born to a mother who has suffered FGM should be the subject of a child intervention order. I would ask the Minister whether it might not be better to look at it as a child protection issue and to treat such a birth as you would domestic violence, where you support the mother, who is also a victim, as well as the child, as well as protect the child. Presenting officer, FGM is a problem affecting communities in nearly every part of Scotland, with the largest concentration in our cities, Glasgow, Aberdeen, Edinburgh and Dundee. There are more than 350 girls born every year into these at-risk communities here in Scotland, that is, to mothers from an FGM practising or affected country. So this problem is going to be with us for many years to come. Despite efforts made by campaigning groups, by uh, MSP colleagues, notwithstanding legislation passed in this Parliament, public awareness on female genital mutilation remains low in Scotland. We on all sides of this chamber have a responsibility to increase that awareness and to do much more to put a stop to this brutality in Scotland. The Scottish Government must show national leadership by ensuring that all forms of FGM abuse are recognised as violence against the human rights of women and children. And we must engage constructively with at-risk communities in challenging the cultural and moral attitudes associated with the practice of FGM. In eradicating this practice, we must eradicate the perception that FGM is a rite of passage for young women. Today, this parliament has the opportunity to show international solidarity by condemning female genital mutilation and ensuring we will do what we can here in Scotland to protect all women and girls from FGM. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Jackson Carlow. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Carlow. Uh, presiding officer, I welcome this debate and thank the Cabinet Secretary for bringing this uh, subject, uh, one in which it is not easy to judge comment lightly uh, to the Chamber and for his commitment to working in partnership across a number of different agencies in Scotland to tackle the shocking and abhorrent practice of female genital mutilation in Scotland, which Scottish Conservatives completely agree is the key to fighting this practice. And I welcome the content and the various announcements and comments made by the Cabinet Secretary in his opening speech. I also am aware and acknowledge uh, that both Jenny Mara and Hans Hansala Malik have been steadfast in giving this issue attention. And I think that the Scottish Government now gives it such a high priority and a real change in our approach to tackling FGM uh, is an advance for which they can claim, in some measure, deserved credit. Scottish Conservatives, together with this Parliament, clearly are united in our commitment to ending FGM in the UK and ensuring that all girls have the right to live from, free from violence and coercion and the lifelong physical and psychological effects of FGM. That said, I believe that it is clear that it will now take increased partnership from the police, education services, health services and child agencies if we are to put a decisive end 
to sort of shaming headlines of recent years that Scotland was thought to be something of a soft touch. The BBC investigation in 2013 that revealed concerns that young girls were being brought to Scotland to undergo FGM because Scotland then was viewed as a country that perhaps didn't take this issue as seriously as I believe it now does. There are still, as Ken McIntosh has, and both the Cabinet Secretary have said, yet to be any prosecutions for FGM in Scotland, even though Police Scotland has investigated a number of cases involving girls. And this is not due to any failing on the police's behalf, but simply underlines the particular challenges of secrecy within the communities committing this crime. And I noticed, too, all the Cabinet Secretary had to say a few moments ago regarding the number of cases referred and investigated. And I accept the argument that prevention of FGM must be the priority. How I, however, I believe it is equally essential that prosecutions are seen where appropriate to take place in order to act as the effective deterrent to those mutilating girls and girls' families. This is supported by the Scottish Refugee Council, as has been said, and I suspect the nature of many of the speeches this afternoon will prove to be somewhat repetitive, who have called for the Scottish Government to ensure that the criminal justice system response in Scotland is perceived as being effective and that anyone found to have subjected a child living in Scotland to FGM will face robust criminal sanctions. A prosecution in Scotland may help to ensure that these brutal criminals have nowhere to hide. However, it is arguable that it is only when that at the attitudes and the community culture will start to change in conjunction with the community education initiatives to which the Cabinet Secretary referred. Figures from forces across the UK reveal dozens of suspected FGM offences have been recorded over the last few years, but only a handful of arrests have been made, with the first FGM prosecution in, in the UK ending in the accused doctor being acquitted yesterday. And we must learn lessons from this UK trial, which the acquitted doctor has labelled a show trial, and from which it has now emerged that the alleged victim never supported the case. What is clear is the doctor was not adequately prepared for the circumstances which faced him, and that the hospital had failed to pick up on the wounds' medical history. But I think it just illustrates how difficult this is going to be as an issue to pursue, even though I think we are all committed to the fact that where appropriate pursued it must be. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement today that there will be a girls' summit in Glasgow in March 2015. Uh, the Prime Minister held a girls' summit last year alongside the Home Secretary, where he set out his and his government's commitment to end FGM and childhood forced marriage. He said both should be stopped worldwide within this generation. And at this summit, David Cameron also announced a number of new policies and funding to protect the millions of girls at threat from FGM, both at home and abroad, including new police guidance, new legislation that will mean parents can be prosecuted if they fail to prevent their daughter being cut, a consultation on proposals to introduce new civil orders designed to protect girls' at identities at being risk of FGM, and new legislation to grant victims of FGM lifelong anonymity and a new specialist FGM service, which will include social services to proactively identify and respond. Now, I know that at the time of the Prime Minister's announcement, the Scottish Government spokesman said they would look closely at these policies to see which could be applied in Scotland. And I would appreciate a discursive response from the Cabinet Secretary on how that review is uh, progressing. The Cabinet Secretary has already outlined in his speech the welcome launch by the Women's Support Project of the FGM Training and Public Education Resources. Our education services have a vital role to play in the fight against FGM, and I would draw this to the attention uh, to the NSPCC, who have argued that fundamental to this is detailed child prosecution protection training for teachers in the schools in areas where girls have been identified as at risk for, F for FGM, and ask the Cabinet Secretary to implement this as a matter of urgency in Scotland. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I emphasise Scottish Conservative support and commitment to ending FGM in Scotland, which we believe, and while we believe that Labour amendment is possibly unnecessary, we will support it and offer our support for the Government's motion this afternoon, promoting work and partnership across Scotland. In so doing, we repeat our call to take the action required to support Police Scotland, to secure a prosecution where this may be appropriate, and to stop anyone in the future carrying out FGM in Scotland. Many thanks. We now move to open debate. Six minute speeches. We are tight for time today, so I'll confine you to six minutes, please. Uh, Sandra White to be followed by Margaret McCullough. 
Thank you very much, President Officer. And I also thank the Cabinet Secretary for instigating this debate and uh, welcome the amendment or addendum, as Ken McIntosh called it, uh, from the, the, the Labour benches. Uh, President Officer, I know it's been said before, but I think we have to reiterate this. Uh, I really would like to begin uh, my con contribution by stating that female genital mutilation, or FGM as it's uh, shortened to, is child abuse. We really need to realise that. It is child abuse. There are no medical reasons to carry out this horrendous practice. It doesn't make childbirth safer. It doesn't enhance fertility. Really, it is used to control female sexuality, and it causes severe and long-lasting damage to the victim, both physically and emotionally. And I think everyone here has already said it must be eradicated, and I hope we move on to eradicating this heinous crime. I want to thank uh, the many agencies who are working with communities uh, who could be uh, potentially affected by FGM. And I want to put this into context. I think uh, the Cabinet Secretary already mentioned, as has Ken McIntosh, uh, basically the amount of children, the number of children uh, born in Scotland to mothers who are born or come from an FGM practising country. And we know it has increased significantly. In fact, the Cabinet Secretary gave us the, the numbers uh, for that. I think that's why it's so important we continue to work in these communities as, on a partnership basis, working with all concerned. Now, I'm now a member of the Equal Opportunities Committee, but I was a member a number of years ago, I can think about six or seven years ago, when we looked at FGM at this particular time also and had... Uh, visited agencies in my area in Glasgow at that time, the, the Glasgow regional area, to speak to families there. And we had the families come in in private uh, to speak to us also in the Equal Opportunities Committee. And listening to the evidence from these young women, it was quite horrendous. And obviously our hopes were that we would be able to eradicate it. But as been said before, it's not a short-term issue. It will take time, unfortunately, to not just eradicate, but to educate uh, the people from these communities to stop them basically, as I would say, committing these horrendous crimes. But it's been raised before, all those years ago, and it's raised yet again. In these communities, they may see it as a custom or a rite of passage or a religious aspect. And as I said before, I think we have to continue to mention to people that it's nothing but child abuse and it has to stop. Now, the Scottish Refugee Council report tackling female genital mutilation in Scotland, a Scottish model of intervention, is a, a very good, a good example of the good work that's been carried out by agencies along with the Scottish Government and others, it may be said. And there are five key themes participation, policy, prevention, protection and provision of services. And it's important, it's already been said, and I think Jackson Carlo mentioned as well, that we really need to build up trust within not just the communities, but the, also the agencies that they do work together. In particular, education, absolutely. Uh, I think GERFEX may have a role to play in this particular aspect, uh, you know, the child uh, in education, uh, also in the medical profession as well, and all the agencies that work together on the ground to ensure that we have the trust. We need to have a, a positive relationship with these communities, and that has to be based on trust and built up of trust as well. Otherwise, they will not deliver the key that we wish to get into these communities to stop these heinous crimes and stop you know, the, this uh, particular participation uh, in a criminal act. Uh, we need to lead it to pr uh, prevention. Uh, but I mentioned the fact of education. It was brought to our attention that, obviously, if uh, teachers uh, see that children have been missing for a, a period of time, if they go abroad, if they're within that particular uh, community, that should be picked up. In the medical profession, there was one aspect where uh, women do not want to be medically examined. We need to ensure that they have interpreters when they go in to hospital for anything in particular, and when they give birth as well. There must be a way of finding out when they give birth if anything, uh, you know, this mutilation has taken place previously, and then we can protect the child as well. Now, I know it's a, it's a subject that's very, very difficult to speak about and deal with, 
But that's the reason why it's so important that we do uh, deal with it and we do talk about it. I know one of my colleagues is going to explain more of the medical aspects of it as well, uh, Margaret McDougall. Uh, so I won't go into that field of it, uh, basically, but when you actually hear some of the terminology, what actually happens uh, to these young girls is absolutely horrendous and it is child abuse and violence against women. Uh, it's been mentioned about the lack of uh, prosecutions and obviously we saw the case that dropped uh, there just at, uh, south of the border. Uh, it's very difficult, has been said, to put forward a prosecution. You do, first of all, have, obviously, the jury is there, you have the evidence, is it sufficient, and then you have the child themselves. Now, it's very difficult even to come forward and say this has happened to you, because basically it's within your family, and to turn on your family or them to turn on you is a very difficult thing to do for anyone, no matter close, what please. age, but it's very difficult for a child. So I thank the Cabinet Secretary very much for bringing this uh, debate forward here, and hopefully we can push it forward to eradicate this heinous crime. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I call on Margaret McCulloch to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Since we last debated International Day of Zero Tolerance and FGM, the Equal Opportunities Committee has continued scoping the potential for an inquiry. As convener, I also held a number of confidential meetings with those who work directly with the victims. Today, I want to take a step back and explain FGM, what it is and why it happens. And I also want to share some of my own thoughts. Presiding officer, UNICEF estimate that there are over 120 million women and girls living with the consequences of FGM worldwide, mainly in 29 African countries where the practicing population is high and also in areas like Kurdistan, Iraq and Egypt. Mass migration and cross-border travel brings opportunities, but it also means that policymakers here must confront unfamiliar challenges such as FGM. Those I met with are keen to stress that there are different forms of FGM and that the World Health Organization has defined four distinct categories, which I will explain to the Chamber. Type one mainly involves a partial or total removal of the clitoris. Type two, excision, again involves partial or total removal of the clitoris as well as the partial or total removal, removal of the labia. Type 3, infubulation involves the narrowing of the orifice and creating a seal by cutting and repositioning the labia with or without cutting the clitoris. Type 4 covers all other procedures, including pricking and burning, and some of the most extreme and disturbing forms of FGM. Needless to say, there are no health benefits in any of these procedures. It only serves to injure and to harm. It causes physical pain, bleeding, shock, infection, and longer term, abscesses, cysts, adhesions, and neuromas. Type 3 FGM can cause further complications, such as re reproductive tract infections and incontinence. Many of the women who are cut experience chronic pain and recurring infections for the rest of their lives. They may also experience depression, terrifying flashbacks, vivid nightmares and post-traumatic stress. According to the World Health Organization, death rates among babies during and immediately after childbirth were higher for those born to mothers who had undergone some kind of FGM. FGM primarily, primarily occurs up to the age of 15, mainly in girls between 5 and 8. But adult cases often involve restoring type 3 after childbirth or a husband forcing his wife to be cut as a condition of marriage. FGM is most often carried out by someone with no formal medical training. In those cases, there would be no anaesthetic and it will be typically done with a knife, scissors, razor blades or even bits of glass. It is estimated that 3 million girls are cut every year and often they are forcibly restrained. FGM has no basis in religion. It's a cultural practice rooted in, patriarch in patriarchy and gender inequality. 
It can be seen as a prerequisite of marriage in societies where marriage is the only means of achieving status and economic security. There is also a widely held belief in practice in communities that FGM can preserve a girl's chastity before marriage and her faithfulness afterwards. Without being cut, a girl can become an outcast. Pressure on young girls to undergo FGM can come from those closest to her. In the most extreme cases of FGM brought to my attention by organisations working here in the UK concerned a girl who resisted being cut. After years of avoiding the procedure, she was taken by force, held down and subjected to one of the most extreme forms of type 4 FGM where she was cut and mutilated. That individual story is so distressing that I can't share all the details with the Chamber today. I've also heard some other similar stories where girls are subjected to the most distress and disturbing violence by the people they know. Presiding officer, the challenge before us is to eliminate this cruelty against women and children. We must play our part internationally, but we must also recognise in Scotland there are victims needing support and there are women at risk and girls at risk. We need to build the capacity to reach women and children in affected communities to ensure they can be protected. We have to develop best practice, training the health, social work and education professionals to recognise the signs and work sensitively with those affected. We also need to work with affected communities to tackle the reality of FGM and the effects it has on women and girls. This is abuse and all abuse is unacceptable. But let's also be clear that a strategy of persuasion and prevention must not conflict with a principle of zero tolerance. It must not preclude prosecutions. Presiding officer, FGM is an abuse of women, of girls, of their bodies and of their human rights. It's a crime, it's a violation, it's abhorrent and it must be stopped. Thank you. Thank you. Now I call on Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Alison McInnes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I wish to start by thanking the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government for bringing this important issue before the Chamber today, uh, on the day before the International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation. It's an issue I've long been concerned about. And indeed, I first submitted a motion to this Parliament condemning the practice some 14 years ago. FGM is an abhorrent, primitive and almost unspeakable form of violence towards girls and women as we have heard so eloquently from, uh, from Margaret McCulloch just a few moments ago. It is also an especially pernicious form of child abuse, as many members have commented. UNICEF estimates that half of all girls subjected to FGM are under the age of five, while most of the remainder are under the age of 14. I know that members across the chamber are united in condemning an antediluvian practice that does so much harm to millions of girls and women around the world, both in terms of their physical and psychological health. However, some members might be surprised to hear of how prevalent this practice is in some communities relatively close to home. Members might expect to hear about instances of FGM being inflicted upon girls in pockets of the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. But what about in Birmingham? In 2013, the Sunday Times magazine reported that Birmingham Heartlands Hospital had handled some 700 cases of FGM over the course of the preceding 27 months. And in 2012, the Royal College of Midwives stated that up to 66,000 women in the UK may have endured the agony of FGM. If FGM is being carried out in such numbers so close to home, that is absolutely shocking, and I know members will share my disbelief. And these Birmingham figures are deeply disturbing. If FGM is being inflicted upon so many girls in these islands, then how prevalent is it here in Scotland, in the communities we are elected to represent and serve? Tackling female genital mutilation in Scotland, a Scottish model of intervention, the Scottish Refugee Council report produced in conjunction with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, provides useful policy recommendations, but doesn't shed any light on how prevalent the practice may be in Scotland, and nor does it claim to. In fact, the report explicitly says that, and I quote, at the time of writing, there were no published studies looking at the scope of FGM in Scotland. I recognise, as other members have today, the sensitivity of this issue and the challenges in gathering this kind of data. Nevertheless, I hope research will be carried out in the near future. It will not be possible for a society to gauge the extent of 
and comprehensively address this problem if we cannot define its scope. The Scottish Refugee Council report indicates that 24,000 uh, women in Scotland were born in FGM practising countries. These women live in every local authority area, yet we are not able to reasonably reduce how prevalent the practice is. All we can infer is the number of girls and women who may be at risk, which in reality could be very different from the number actually subjected to FGM. For its part, I welcome the actions of the Scottish Government in, in addressing this issue, uh, some of which the Cabinet Secretary outlined today. And I hope Ministers will continue to prioritise this issue as more research is conducted and evidence comes to light. In the meantime, the Scottish Refugee Council's report offers useful insights into policies implemented in several other European countries to combat FGM. And perhaps there is some scope for replicating what has worked elsewhere in a Scottish context. When Francois Mitterrand was elected President of the French Republic in 1981, he created a new Ministry of Women's Rights. This move is credited with ensuring that FGM stayed relatively high up the policy agenda, following a number of FGM-related deaths in France in the early 1980s. The Scottish Refugee Council report also noted that there has been relative success in France after public information campaigns raised awareness about the criminality of FGM, which may partly explain why France has a relatively high number of convictions for FGM-related offences. For its, its part, the Scottish Government already has ministers with responsibilities for issues of particular importance to women spread across several portfolios, and I have every confidence that the Cabinet Secretary, amongst others, will continue to ensure this issue is prioritised. I recognise the importance of appropriate engagement with those communities with the largest number of potentially affected girls and the need for sensitivity when dealing with this problem if we want to make progress in addressing it. However, this desire to show sensitivity should never do anything to reduce the vigour with which we pursue this issue. FGM, quite simply, can have no place in modern Scotland. During the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow this last summer, Scotland sent a bold and unequivocally clear message to the rest of the world, and in particular those areas where persecution of and violence against individuals on the basis of sexual orientation is still commonplace. The pride flag flying in front of St Andrew's House throughout the Games was a positive gesture towards valuing equality. Presiding officer, before we can have any credibility in speaking out against FGM in other parts of the world where this despicable practice is prevalent, we must ensure we are doing all we reasonably can to eradicate it at home. As a global citizen, part of Scotland's contribution to the world is through the positive example it sets for other nations and societies. And of course, FGM is not just a woman's issue. Speaking as a son, a father and a brother, I don't want a society in which FGM is permitted or ignored, and I certainly don't want a society in which uh, some women from southern minorities communities feel that they do not have the protection of our society. Let's strive to lead the fight against FGM by our own example here in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. Now I call on Alison McInnes to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. It's a crying shame that in 2015 girls all around the world are subjected to this brutal abuse. All the most shaming that it's actually happening to girls born here in our own country. It's hard to bear, hard to hear that young girls are in pain, isolated and frightened. That women are living with the daily consequences of FGM, difficulties with menstruation, pelvic and urinary tract infections, painful intercourse, for some infertility, for others difficulties with childbirth and an increased risk of stillbirth or haemorrhage, not to mention the psychological consequences of such a trauma. It's hard to hear that teenagers fear for their younger sisters, yet despair of their parents changing long-held views. But here we must because hard though it is, it's nothing to the burden that these girls and women carry. We all have to face up to it and demand an end to it. We must speak up for those girls and women around the world until they are confident enough to break the cycle and assert that they will not allow their daughters, their sisters, their nieces or their grandchildren to be cut. The World Health Organisation estimates 140 million women and girls in the world have been subjected to this. And yet, until recently, it has been considered a minority issue. But now at last, I think there's a tidal wave of change to end this damaging practice within a generation. We know there's a lack of data, but the Scottish Refugee Council tell us that they think there were 363 girls born in Scotland to mothers who had been born in an FGM practising country in 2012. They advise that there are potentially affected communities in every local authority area 
with the largest groupings in Glasgow, Aberdeen, Edinburgh and Dundee. Other people have talked about the lack of prosecutions, and I understand the difficulties in bringing prosecutions, but we must also understand the message that successful prosecutions could send and how powerful that would be. So we must robustly pursue criminal convictions. But as the Scottish Refugee Council says, that strong criminal justice message must be accompanied by investment and behaviour change interventions with affected communities, in particular with key community leaders, with young people and with men. Never has it been more important to seek the active involvement and participation of the at-risk communities. I want to press for a focus on three issues. Firstly, what can be done in communities to empower young girls and women to challenge, to refuse, to be strong enough to seek help, to feel safe in asking for help? We know it's a complex emotional issue and we shouldn't underestimate the tensions between family tradition and the wish to change. And that's a struggle faced by many FGM survivors who know the harm they've suffered but are unwilling to break with the culture that condoned it. So peer education is central. One woman recently explained, deciding not to get my daughter's cut was a tough decision to make. Going against tradition can be difficult. First, you need to convince yourself that the decision you're making is the best one. You need to know the facts in order to do that. And once you have been trained on FGM and the consequences, you can make the courageous decision to go against tradition. Secondly, what support is there for victims who have already been mutilated and are living with the scars, the mental and physical scars? Um, in England, we have specialist clinics in major cities. Does the government have plans to develop centres of excellence in Scotland? And, and thirdly, the need for training and guidance for professionals. Um, it's a very pressing need, I think, particularly for GPs, for maternity services and school staff. The Scottish Government and local authority leads should provide national and from that local direction on clear child intervention responses where an FGM survivor gives birth to a girl. But the Scottish, the Scottish Re Refugee Council do not think it should be an automatic child protection referral. Local authorities and local health boards should develop a network of named professionals with expertise on FGM across Scotland, and they must ensure that clear referral pathways are in place. Some concern has been expressed about that automatic child protection referral, um, so we do need that clear guidance. Um, I want to congratulate the government on the developments that the minister has outlined today and for the vigour with which they are pursuing this, and associate myself with the praise Alex Neil has given to the wide range of third sector partners. Like other members, I thought the Labour amendment was unnecessary, but we will support it. At the end of the day, this is about a girl's ability to make decisions about her own life and her own body, and we must do all we can to ensure that every girl in Scotland has that autonomy. Many thanks. I call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Patricia Ferguson. Thank you very much, President Officer. The very idea of FGM appalls most people. We shudder and we reject the 5,000-year-old tradition of brutal and often unclean surgery carried out in young girls. It's intolerable, it's obscene, and it's undoubtedly a child abuse um, issue. Uh, and in some cases, Presiding Officer, that abuse takes place with the active consent of some mothers. So when Alison McInnes was talking about educating mothers and working with mothers, that's something that's very, very important because going against that natural tradition is something that's very, very tough. Um, but for us, you know, to sit in critical judgment of the practice will get us nowhere and achieve no liberation for those who are suffering at the end of a scalpel. Condemning it from a white, westernised, liberal, modern social democracy fails because it doesn't take into account the wider context, the wider picture. The Refugee Council's report, of which we've heard a lot of this afternoon, provides an excellent understanding of the background within which we need to carefully, sensitively seek to bring about change. And can I pay tribute to um, the Refugee Women's Group, who have done amazing work in this area in a number of areas over the past few years, and I've had the real privilege to work with them on some of that work. The Refugee Council, its authors point out that FGM is an emotive and complex issue. And as such, it cannot be tackled by simply slapping our answers on the back of another culture's issues. 
The Refugee Council estimates that there are many thousands of men, women and children who were born in one of the 29 countries identified by UNICEF in 2013 as FGM practising countries are now living in Scotland. Can I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's awareness of the commitments um, and the recommendations and his commitment to the five Ps? It's something that's been worked on over a number of years to bring it to the stage it's at now. Um, and I'm sure the Refugee Council and the, the, the Refugee Women's Group will be very pleased to hear that. The Refugee Council tell us that one of the largest communities um, potentially affected are, are people from Nigeria, with 9,458 people resident in Scotland. The national prevalence rate in Nigeria is relatively low, at 27%. That's compared to 98% in Somalia. So throughout Scotland, these communities are, of course, having children of their own. And we do not, do not currently have the data to give us an overall picture of how many mothers have undergone FGM, nor can we measure the likelihood that the 363 girls that we've all spoken about today, born here over the last decade, could find themselves victims of FGM. What we clearly have is a responsibility to build on compassion and health care, to work with, not against, the communities where FGM is practised. Both the policy makers and the service providers need to make sure that everything that we do is shaped and driven by the experiences, the needs and the views of the communities affected. That means our interventions need to carry the support of the communities involved, not the resentment. We need to work out to build change from within, because only by doing that we are going to shift the mindsets that have been unchanged for those 5,000 years of tradition. Yes, we need to have in place a strong criminal justice message, but it needs to be accompanied by investment and behaviour change interventions with the affected communities. We need to look towards particular segments within those groups, key community leaders, young people and men. Without a genuine and effective commitment to the participation of affected communities in work on this issue, not only will we fail to understand the true levels of the potential risks faced by women and girls in Scotland today, we will run the risk of further marginalising the community voices that are the most effective advocates for change. We have a duty to ensure that NHS, NHS Scotland is providing the right healthcare provision to survivors of FGM so that we remove any danger of insensitive or judgmental responses and have instead a culturally competent reaction. We need to be careful not to stigmatise the victims too. Taken together, what we need to drive forward is a meaningful, well-structured, multidisciplinary hub service, much like Alison McInnes has mentioned, in Scotland, with clear links to named professionals. Frontline staff should be carefully and sensitively trained to carry out inquiries about FGM, and pregnant women in the risk groups will need to be identified and supported. Criminal justice and child protection must not be enacted effectively and fair, must be acted effectively and fairly. But for that to work, professionals from all sectors need to have a clear and accessible risk assessment with reporting guidelines. Tomorrow, as we know, is International Day of Zero Tolerance of Female Genital Mutilation. It is a timely remember that Scotland is home to many women and girls who are survivors or at risk of this brutal and intimate violence. However abhorrent, however violent the practice is, we have to look at ways of changing behaviour, changing attitudes, changing traditions as we are already doing so across the wider domestic violence abuse issues. But, Cabinet Secretary, but we must bring the affected communities along with that change. We cannot enforce it upon them. We have to work with them, and I ask you to do that. Thank you. Many thanks. Um, before I call uh, Patricia Ferguson to be followed by John Mason, I just want to say we've gained a little bit of time um, so there is an opportunity, should people wish to make, shall we say, supportive interventions. Um, Patricia Ferguson, to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As other colleagues have now said, it is entirely fitting that we debate this issue on the eve of the International Day of Zero Tolerance of FGM. And I would want to add my thanks to all those organisations and individuals who raise their voices about this uh, issue and who work hard to support uh, those who have been victims of it or who think they may be in the future. FGM is, of course, an abhorrent practice. It is both physically and psychologically damaging and must not be tolerated. But it is, of course, a practice that is clouded in secrecy. Within communities and within families, it remains a secret, one not to be spoken of. 
Sometimes the victims are embarrassed to seek help. Sometimes they want to protect a family member. And often they are simply too afraid to make it known. So they live with the fear and the shame. And they live with the discomfort and the pain. And they often live with the knowledge that their own family members were complicit in inflicting this terrible ordeal upon them. In some cases, girls are taken on holiday to meet family members, only to find that the real reason for their visit is to inflict FGM upon them. Many women and girls report that their female family members actively participated in the process, often holding them down while they were cut. So they live too with the betrayal of the people who should be most concerned with their care and welfare. And this secrecy and this fear makes it hard for agencies to identify and support those who have been the victims of FGM and of course to prosecute those who encourage or inflict it. But we have to recognise that we have to do more in order to get over these particular difficulties. Now, following on from the Girls' Summit organised by the UK Government last year, campaigners have suggested that the number of women and girls contacting them to ask for help quadrupled. Now, hopefully tomorrow's event and the Girls' Summit organised by the Lord Provost of Glasgow, Sadie Doherty, will have a similar effect in shining a light on this practice. And hopefully, too, women and girls will find the courage to uh, raise their voices and to speak out about this as a result. But we have to ask ourselves critically if we are prepared for a possible quadrupling of people uh, identifying themselves as victims or possible victims. Are all the systems in place to support them? Do the organisations best place to help have the resources they need to provide that help and support? And do the practising communities have the support they need to make a difference and to make that vital change? Coordination of all of that is absolutely important. And I think that is really what the, the Labour Addendum Amendment tried to pose. Because the hidden nature of this crime demands that resources are provided, but also that they are very carefully targeted. And we too must continue to try to do whatever we can to persuade the practising communities that this cannot carry on. I noticed that at the Girls' Summit, the UK government launched a declaration against the FGM, which they asked faith leaders to sign. And I understand that to date, some 350 faith leaders have signed this declaration, which asserts that no religion condones this practice. And I wonder whether this is something that the Scottish Government might also consider organising, as clearly we need the support of community leaders in the fight to eradicate FGM. We need those people to lead the way in their communities. And crucially, we need the support, I think Christina McKelvey mentioned this, of the men in those communities to support the mothers and the women making the decision not to allow this to continue into the next generation. Presiding officer, we don't know the scale of the problem in Scotland, but we do know that a prevalent study published by Equality Now, who the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, and City University, identified that approximately 60,000 girls aged from birth to 14 have been born in England and Wales to mothers who had themselves undergone FGM. Now, that's a quite shocking figure in my view. But we must also presume that proportionately, the figure in Scotland will be roughly similar in proportion. But we do need more research to allow us to fully understand the scale of the problem here. So I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to a baseline study. Now, those of us who live and work in areas where there is a high concentration of asylum seekers know that there are young women and girls affected by this practice living in our communities. There must be. And in my view, the possibility of FGM being carried out in a young woman or a girl should be part of the monitoring and assessment process undertaken uh, when asylum claims are being processed. Because policies have to be consistent on this issue if they are to be effective. Now, as the Labour motion says, it is a disappointment that there have been so few prosecutions to date, although perhaps understandable. And perhaps more needs to be done to coordinate the response of the agencies to cases of abuse so I very much welcome the partnership approach the Scottish Government is taking. 
but we must always be vigilant and constantly look to see what else will make a difference. As the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, the UK Government has recently consulted on the idea of mandatory reporting of FGM. And interestingly, the BMA briefing we were all sent on the issue made it clear that this was something that they did not support. Now, I was initially surprised by this stance and I asked them for more information, which they have provided. But I must, convince, uh, must confess that I'm not convinced by their argument, which seems to suggest that doctors should make a decision based on the circumstances of the individual case. Now, it seems to me that doctors would not hesitate to report other forms of abuse. So why should FGM be treated any differently? And interestingly, again, this seems to run counter to the approach of the midwives' organisations who think all sh cases should be reported. But the reason I mention it in the debate, presiding officer, is because I'd be interested to know, just genuinely interested, if the Scottish Government has had any discussion or consideration uh, has been given to mandatory reporting as an option in policy. Presiding officer, in this debate, we've heard FGM described as child abuse, and it is. But I would go further and say that FGM is akin to torture. We must make it clear that we will support anyone who is a victim of FGM or fears they might be. We must offer them our understanding, our compassion and our support. But our determination to help these women and girls must be matched by our determination to act against the perpetrators. And we must be united in saying that FGM is not tolerated in this country. Thank you very much. I now call on John Mason to be followed by Hans Anna Malik. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I have to start by saying I do not find this the easiest topic to speak on, and we have already had a number of very moving speeches uh, on this subject. Um, but perhaps the fact that it is not easy to talk about is one of the problems. Uh, and so I am pleased that we're having this debate, and I did feel that I should attempt to speak about it. I'm grateful for the different briefings we have received for today's uh, debate, and especially for the report from the Scottish Refugee Council, already referred to this afternoon. When we started looking at the subject of FGM at the Equal Opportunities Committee, I was struck by the lack of information about the situation in Scotland, and that continues to be the case. We have had some information given to us on a confidential basis, but even then, a lot seems to be second-hand, informal and uncertain. I think one of the aims of the SRC report or scoping study was to see what we could learn from our European neighbours, and immediately it becomes apparent that the French and the Dutch do things slightly differently from each other. From what I can understand, the French model uh, certainly involves compulsory medicals for all girls, and that has the advantage of even-handedness, but maybe does not fit quite so well with the way we do things here, by way of respecting ethnic minorities and allowing them to operate a bit differently, as I think uh, Christina McKelvey was referring to. France has also had some high-profile criminal cases, and that seems to have had more impact than merely stating that FGM is illegal. I think the Netherlands is emphasising prevention, with relevant professionals being highly trained in spotting danger signs. It, and that has been made clear to us at a committee, although we're really only beginning to look at the subject, that one of the high-risk times is when young girls travel abroad, as has been mentioned. I understand uh, the Dutch and also the Catalans try to tackle this by issuing government certificates, saying the parents will be in trouble if FGM is carried out. And the hope is that extended family members in the home country will take this seriously, not least because the transfer of money from Europe could be halted. I understand this idea has been used on a, similar, a smaller scale in Scotland, eh, possibly with the parents actually signing a certificate that they will not allow FGM to be carried out. I have to say my gut feeling is that I'm more comfortable with this approach than what some might see as the more heavy-handed and intrusive French approach. Yet yeah, I also note the argument that if you have to choose between regular physical checks on young girls on the one hand and the potential for FGM actually being carried out on the other hand, most of us will be pretty clear about which is worse. One of the things that has also interested me and I would like to know more about is how some African or Middle Eastern countries have reduced the prevalence in their own countries. I do not think this is something that the SRC study has concentrated on, but it strikes me that if we want a sustainable long-term solution, the answer has to lie in the home countries. 
just as controlling immigration is best done by people having a decent life in their own country rather than putting a fence around UK or Europe, so surely if the prevalence is reduced in Africa or the Middle East, it will almost inevitably have a knock-on effect here. First, we can learn from countries which are tackling FGM seriously, and secondly, perhaps we can actually think of helping them if finance or improving literacy, for example, would be beneficial. So I just did a quick look uh, today at uh, uh, one of the countries that does seem to have made some improvements, which is Kenya, uh, where they state that the estimated prevalence of FGM in girls and women aged 15 to 49 is now 27.1%, uh, and that is a reduction from 37.6% in 1998 and 32.2% in 2003, and that certainly strikes me as quite a significant reduction. As I say, I only look briefly at the report, but it is quite interesting to look at some of the history in Kenya. They talk about attempts being made uh, to persuade communities to abandon, abandon FGM by, uh, first by Christian missionaries and colonial authorities in the early 20th century and later by Western, Western feminists in the 60s and 70s. These attempts were largely considered to be Western imperialism and something imposed on communities by outsiders. It says that Kenya's first president, Kenyatta, was a strong proponent of the practice. But during the UN decade for women in 76 to 85, the Kenyan government participated in a series of conferences and the movement to eradicate FGM continued uh, since then. A national action plan for accelerating the abandonment of FGM in Kenya, 2008 to 12, uh, was taken forward. And it, it meant, lists some of the interventions that were made uh, have been made in Kenya, which seem to have had an impact. Some have been mentioned uh, already today. Uh, things like, um, well, health risk, harm, uh, harmful traditional practice, addressing the health complications, educating practitioners, uh, alternative rites of passage, uh, and uh, so on. The, it was raised at uh, one of our committee meetings that uh, there's probably greater prevalence in Glasgow than in Edinburgh, but perhaps Edinburgh uh, had moved further ahead in, in some of the support and help being given. I did write to the Director of uh, Social Work in Glasgow about that, and as I think, as has been mentioned, uh, there's an event tomorrow uh, and a DVD being launched uh, in, in line with the Women's Support Project. Uh, now, because we're looking at this subject, both in today's debate and the Equal Opportunities Committee, I think some members have had emails, as I have, uh, suggesting that male circumcision should also be restricted. Can I say that I think this is a completely different issue and male circumcision has been practiced safely for thousands of years. I suspect some of the motivation for people raising this is to criticize the Jews and potentially Muslims and other groups. So I think we do need to stay focused on what we are looking at today, which is FGM, which I think is a completely different order and concern. So in conclusion, I hope we can all agree on the importance of this issue, that we need to continue seeking facts about the situation in Scotland and continue to use all means to reduce the prevalence of FGM. If that includes some high-profile prosecutions, well and good, but if the prevalence can be reduced without prosecutions, eh, I, for one, would certainly welcome that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Hans Alan Malik to be followed by Christo Alla. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. I welcome this debate on female gender mutilation. I have had serious concerns about this subject for a number of years now and have attempted to look at as much detail as possible into the subject. Scotland made FGM illegal in 2005. However, we have had no prosecutions. This is hardly surprising as FGM is rarely discussed in the communities, let alone reported. It is a very difficult and complex practice that has existed for thousands of years now. In an interview, a community activist stated that the nature of the subject is so private that many girls from practicing countries are not even aware of FGM exists and that many would be at risk when they go to visit practicing countries. I commend the Scottish Government uh, in their effort to tackle with such a serious and complex issue. I feel that the scoping work by the Scottish Refugee Council and the improved multi-agency coordinators are a good foundation 
on which to build on. I have a lot of experience in working with minority communities in Scotland, and one of the major points is in order to have a real change, it has to be the communities themselves that have to decide to change. The practice of FGM is rooted in some communities, but I have had the honor of meeting both men and women from these communities who are actively and passionately working against FGM. The, organize, the, or, the organizations commended in the motion for their valuable contribution in tackling FGM in Scotland has all stated that the key to long-term change is to support and reassure communities to address this issue. This means having a much long-term strategy in investment in community development itself. Now at the moment, most public bodies, including the Scottish Government, hold one of, one of engagement events or consultations. Although these are also important in terms of informing communities about health service, etc., but have a limited impact. Now if I imagine for example, I am a Somali woman living in Glasgow, and I know it's a little difficult to imagine. <laughs> and imagine I get a flyer in inviting me to a talk on FGM. I probably won't go, because I don't call it FGM in the first place. Even if I did know what it was, why would I want to attend? It doesn't sound very exciting to me or to anybody else for that matter. Now, if there was a group that I attended where the people I was comfortable with who happened to talk about the issue, I assume that people would be more willing to listen, discuss, and perhaps even share their experiences. As the chair of a cross-party working group on Middle East and South Asia, I've held a round table discussion groups followed by a report on FGM for that report, I would like to give an example of progress. FGM for, from the Kurdistan regional government in Iraq, the figures emerge that from Kurdistan region given rise to caution or optimism. FGM is that part of the world is described, decided that from 73% which some of the local communities have reduced to 60%, which is a huge difference for that part of the world. Kurdistan regional government passed a law making FGM illegal. And I think I would want to congratulate them at this, part, at this point because it is a difficult uh, decision for them to have made uh, and they have to be commended for that. And I think I would want to commend every government that makes that decision. The problem is complex. Some refugees have sought asylum in the UK because they have been persecuted uh, for campaigning against FGM in their own countries. Presiding officer, it is important that today's debate is sending out a clear zero tolerance message uh, against FGM. But more importantly, it's absolutely critical that the Scottish Government actually engages with the communities themselves. The idea of the, Sc the Scottish Refugee Council and various other statutory organizations doing this job it's not going to happen, and I think that uh, sometimes we are uh, perhaps um, guilty of underestimating the power of the communities themselves. Uh, I believe that funding community groups, assisting them in the process would be more advantageous and I believe would drive the real results that we're looking for. One of the things we need to always, under, uh, one, of the re one of the issues we all should always understand it's the communities that will do this work. It won't be us. And unless we support them in that, uh, they will not succeed. It is absolutely critical and essential that we support those communities in, in undertaking those uh, responsibilities. And I, as well as the parliament, would want to wish them the very best in that. Thank you very much. Many thanks. I now call on Christian Allard to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. 
Yesterday morning, I had the visit of a group of students, young women who wanted to understand better how this parliament works. I'm pleased that we tweeted last night two words to qualify the visit, happy and progressive. And we are always happy to say that uh, this parliament is a happy parliament. Uh, the contribution of this debate are certainly demonstrating how progressive this modern parliament is. And yet, we cannot be in a happy place when debating female genital mutilation. As a member of the Equal Opportunities Committee, I found it difficult to call this unacceptable and illegal practice by its abbreviation, FGM. Ken McIntosh told us uh, that many people in Scotland didn't understand what FGM was. Maybe one of the reasons is because we use its abbreviation, and I will ask the Cabinet Secretary to reflect in pass. You know, we, we might want to call it what it is for people to understand a, a, a lot you know, easier what it really is. Uh, to best tackle female genital mutilation, I would encourage anyone to use its full name, female genital mutilation. We did a lot of work at committee level, and we had a lot of uh, members of the Equal Opportunity Committee talking about it, uh, some in public session and some in private session. Uh, we really all were looking forward to the publication of the Scottish Refugee Council report on female genital mutilation in Scotland, and that will help our committee as well uh, going forward. Uh, let me add my thanks to the Scottish Refugee Council and to all who participated in making this report relevant to both the situation across the world and here in Scotland. And of course, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice Committees and Pensioners' Rights for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Partnership is key, is indeed the best world to use today as a recognised solution both by the Scottish Government and this report, a solution to best tackle female genital mutilation in Scotland. This partnership must include the communities affected by this terrible practice right from the beginning to create long-term behaviour changes. This report recognises that communities have to be involved as much uh, as at strategic level, but also as in prevention, as in data gathering, and as in protecting the victims of female genital mutilation. When I say communities, private uh, presenting officer, I would like to point out, uh, uh, like other members did uh, before me, a free woman did before me, that the role of men in these communities must not be excluded, but be seen as part of the solution to end this unacceptable and illegal practice. However, victims for me should always be at the centre of the debate, not on front pages of newspapers, but fronting any approach on tackling female genital mutilation. We heard today, and members of the Equal Opportunities heard before that, that different countries have different approaches. And John Mason talked a lot about France, for example. Um, I have no problem with this, uh, but I like to say, you know, Jackson Carlo talked about England as well, what happened in England and Wales. I like to say that as much as we learn a lot from what's happening abroad, I strongly believe in a Scottish solution for a Scottish problem. Because let's not forget Communities, it's our own communities. They are Scottish communities. Whatever people come from, whatever they are first generation, second generation, third generation, they are part of Scotland, they are part of our communities. So we have to reflect this when we go into legislation or when we're going to, to er eradicate uh, this problem. And uh, one thing I would like to say, uh, presenting officer, I would like to kind of apologize to the media because during uh, our evidence and, and, and when we talked about it at committee level, uh, I kind of think that sensitive, because it's such a sensitive issue, maybe the media will not be apt to talk about it. And, and I can't change my mind. I think Scottish media particularly, I think uh, will be well equipped to do so. And I take the example of children's sex abuse that we have seen, the cases that we have seen over the years. And I think the media contributed very well at explaining to people. I understand that secrecy that uh, uh, some uh, of the members talked about it early on. And maybe uh, putting, you know, removing the veil from, from, from what's happening out there. And uh, I think we should take connections and, and uh, Christina Macher, we talk about it. Us Western uh, civilization and Western nations have to understand that uh, what 
we do is seen as bad from other countries of what other countries' practices have. And, you know, let's go back to the children's sex abuse. Let's remember that we need a New Zealand, New Zealand High Court judge uh, to come uh, to lead an inquiry on this historical uh, child sex abuse in England and Wales. So that gives us a bit of perspective, and I will encourage the media to talk about it on, 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 on that way, not, not targeting uh, particular committees, but really uh, ta um, targeting the issue which is most important. Important. Uh, we live in one world with multi communities and challenging isolated members of different communities is important as well. Communities don't always live on their own in this uh, global world. Uh, people will, will be more and more isolated. So we need to, to, to understand that better. To conclude, President Officer, let me address the amendment by, uh, by Labour, and I, I welcome the clarification on that point by the Cabinet Secretary. I'm not disappointed that there have been so few prosecutions. Uh, I trust Police Scotland and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service to first investigate, then to bring cases to court. Some consider that legislation on such an acceptable practice must mean that people will automatically reach the courts and be prosecuted. I disagree. Good legislation must be used first as a preventive measure and as a deterrent. And as I say, I trust Police Scotland for this. The example in England, which we, which we are at the beginning of the year, show exactly this. Uh, that, that, you know, these cases can't be forced by political pressure to being brought uh, in front of the court. Uh, I'm more concerned on provision of the communities affected by female genital uh, mutilation and care for the victim. This is why I thank again the Scottish Refugee Council for their report and the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Social Justice for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Uh, tomorrow is the International Day of Zero Tolerance of Female Genital Mutilation. Uh, female Genital Mutilation is a human rights violation that affects an, est an estimated five girls each minute worldwide. UN Secretary General uh, General uh, Ban Ki-moon said health system and health professionals are essential for the well-being of societies. They provide credible scientific and unbiased information that can help people protect themselves from violation of their rights. I believe that this progressive parliament and this government will bring this nation to a better and a happy place. Presenting officer. Thank you very much. Now call on John Finney, after which we move to closing speeches. Thank you, President Officer. I am a fan of international days. I think they bring a worldwide focus on, on issues and what could be a more important issue than this. A warrant to the, the phrase I think Ken McIntosh used of solidarity. I think that is entirely appropriate in, in this instance. I welcome the motion, the reference to the, the thank the Cabinet Secretary for bringing it, the project, the short term working group, and the funding. And I would like to thank all the organisations who are actively involved in this very sensitive work, and indeed some of them for the briefings. Um, Scottish Refugee Council said, and I quote, because of the limitations of global and Scottish data, we do not seek to definitively quantify the nature and extent of female genital mutilation in Scotland. Communities potentially affected by female genital mutilation is the term that, that they're going to use. And I, and I, and I think there's been many references to that dearth of, of uh, hard facts. But of course, the condemnation that's implicit in this motion it's not conditional on numbers. And indeed, we heard at the Equal Opportunity Committee for, uh, last year from one survivor who said, this is not a matter of numbers, but a matter of need. And I think we would all agree that one case is one case to many. Um, uh, can I commend the convener of the Equal Opportunities Committee, who's really grasped this issue and has been um, working very dil diligently, meeting groups and being showing the support of this, this parliament. And I very much enjoyed her speech. I don't intend to make a mention of uh, nationality, countries or indeed religions, because I think this is an issue for us all to address. And if we want to understand some of the challenges, well, then one of the reports uses the term informant. And I think that indicates the level of secrecy and, and uh, sensitivities around it. Um, effective interventions are terribly important. And one of the private briefings we got, we heard from an external NGO they say that women presenting are unlikely to identify themselves as survivors likely only to understand community-specific terminology, frequently meaning purification or cutting, unlikely to be willing to talk about female genital mutilation, unlikely to understand that their health issues are a direct, direct result of female genital mutilation, qualifying that by saying due to the normalization in affected communities, all the women they know have the same problems. And mothers and carers rarely know it's illegal, rarely know that it's harmful, and may say they're opposed to female genital mutilation, even though there aren't. So that's, that's the scale of one of the challenges we have. And prevention clearly is key. 
And education is key to that, and there are challenges with the terminology as we've heard from others, and any discomfort about discussing, for whatever reasons, is not going to help prevention. We have to talk about it, because what we do need is disclosure from individuals, communities and professionals. Um, protection is vital as well, um, not only to those at potential risk, those in imminent risk, but also survivors and their loved ones. And uh, an often missed section is the, the psychological damage that's been visited on the individuals and their families. And I think there's a need to protect and support f uh, familial and, and community relationships, um, which I think we would have to acknowledge are inevitably going to be strained by the however well-meaning involvement of third parties. And we also, we also need to protect these communities from any backlash from anyone any group or individuals who would misunderstand this issue. And we must understand what's needed to protect. And I would suggest that's not always money. Um, and provisions of services and participation are very important too. And as ever, I'll make a plea for the unique nature of um, access to these in rural areas. Yes, the, the NHS will have procedures in place for that. But as studies have shown, the isolation of geographic isolation is often compounded for visible ethnic minority groups in rural areas. So um, I'm sure that will be borne in mind by um, the groups supporting. Um, so we're asked what, what is required and who can tell us. And uh, one of the answers in the report says, the policymakers and service providers should ensure that policy and practice development across all areas of work is shaped and driven by the experience, needs and views of communities affected by female genital mutilation. And none of us would take issue with that, I'm sure. It's very important, uh, in, in my opinion, that this is done by and for communities affected by female genital mutilation, rather than done to them. And a key role for that is um, the police. And um, as a former police officer, I know that practices have changed drastically in relation to things like domestic violence and sexual crimes. Likewise, the uh, Crown Office Procurator um, Fiscal Service, um, social work services with joint investigations, which are child-centered, um, uh, with the outcomes for uh, victims being at the forefront of everyone's deliberations, I think are terribly important. Having said all of that, I don't want to give any uh, suggestion other than that I wholeheartedly believe that this is a violent act against women and girls and must be stopped. And it's a further expression of deeply entrenched gender inequalities like forced marriage and honour-based violence. So I support the need for a, a national action plan. Uh, I, I think behavioural change and many of the, the, the papers talk about that, it does take time. I gave these examples of domestic violence and sexual crimes in our own communities and the different approach that's been taken to that, and I think that that is entirely possible. I'm reassured, I had a comment earlier about the women's support group that talked about some of the materials um, in needing to be updated because some of the references related to English laws and procedures, so I'm heartened to hear from the Cabinet Secretary that the materials, the videos will involve that and I think it's terribly important. Whilst noting what uh, my, my colleague Krishna Allar said about Scottish solutions, I think collaboration is hugely important to this and I know that that wasn't his, his suggestion. Key to this with young folk is the application of the very, very you need to bring your remarks to Yes, close, indeed, please. of getting uh, it right for every child. Um, so what we have heard, President Officer, we've heard of the brutality and the great pressure that women are placed under. We've heard of issues of secrecy and it's important that we don't drive this issue underground. Women who spoke to us privately were adamant that they wanted this action to be taken. I think this is a very helpful debate, and thank you for my participation. Thank you. We now move to the wind-up speeches. Nanette Mill, six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Unsurprisingly, this has been a very consensual debate, indicating this Parliament's commitment to working towards the eradication of female genital mutilation and its support for the Scottish Government's partnership approach to tackling the problem. I first heard about the abhorrent practice of FGM when I was a member of the Equal Opportunities Committee, which took evidence during stage one of the Prohibition of Female Genital Mutilation Scotland Bill, which was approved in 2005. That legislation came 20 years after the practice, euphemistically known at the time as female circumcision, was outlawed by the Westminster government. And I have to say, I was quite shocked to learn on this very date last year, when I was preparing for Jenny Mara's debate to mark the International Day of Zero Tolerance for FGM, there had not been a single police report, prosecution or conviction within the UK for such a brutal assault on young women and girls from certain ethnic communities. It is of some small comfort that there have now been a number of investigations by Police Scotland into potential cases of FGM, as well as the recent trial in England uh, referred to by Jackson Carlaw. But as yet, there have been no prosecutions here. 
However, FGM is almost certainly still going unpunished, and many young lives are at risk of being indelibly blighted by a barbaric practice which, unfortunately, is still deeply embedded in the culture of those communities which sanction and perform it as a rite of passage to womanhood and marriage. There is clearly no disagreement in the Chamber, nor should there be, that FGM is quite unacceptable in a modern civilised society and that it must be tackled and got rid of. Indeed, we've heard some very moving speeches from members about their concerns for the victims of FGM in some of Scotland's migrant communities. Detection and eradication of FGM is, of course, more easily said than done, because, as we know, the practice is very difficult to run to ground, as it's kept very private within the communities where it's practised. And because it often involves family members, such as parents and grandparents, statistics, statistics sorry, are hard to come by. Because of this, and a lack of information on the influence of migration on the practice of FGM, the welcome and recently published report by the SRC, supported by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, which has been frequently quoted today, does, does not definitively quantify the nature and extent of FGM in Scotland, but rather refers to communities in Scotland potentially affected by FGM. It's estimated there are such potentially affected communities living in every local authority area in Scotland, with the largest of them, as we've heard, in the cities of Glasgow, Aberdeen, Edinburgh and Dundee, respectively. And the number of children born into such communities in Scotland has increased over the last 10 years. But without further qualitative research and better data gathering, particularly across the statutory services and among potentially affected communities, the actual problem in Scotland will be difficult to quantify, given the complexity and the emotive nature of FGM. It's interesting that the Refugee Council's research also looked at what's happening across the EU and found that despite having similar statistical challenges to Scotland, EU nations appear to have been successful in tackling FGM and in supporting women and girls within their borders to both resist and to recover from it. This gives us the opportunity, both across Europe and within the UK, as mentioned by Alex Neil in his opening speech, to draw on best practice in developing and taking forward a Scotland-specific approach to intervention. And there's clearly the will to build on all the valuable work we've heard about this afternoon by bringing together the Scottish Government, Police Scotland, the NHS, Education, Social and Child Protection Services and the voluntary and third sector organisations working with children and young people and their families. Jackson Carlaw, in his opening speech, listed some of the policies which the Prime Minister announced and indicated funding for at the Girls' Summit, which he and the Home Secretary hosted last summer, aimed at protecting the many girls at home and abroad who are at risk of FGM and childhood forced marriage. We, of course, welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to fund a programme of work to try and achieve such protection for women and girls thought to be at risk in Scotland. And we look forward to the proposed Girls' Summit to be hosted in Glasgow next month and attended by Lord McConnell and the First Minister. And we hope to hear some policy-specific announcements coming from that event along the lines of those proposed last year by David Cameron. Presiding officer, there's no doubt we're all committed to the eradication of FGM in Scotland. But to achieve this, we must find a way to overcome the centuries of culture which influence the communities which practice FGM. And this is bound to take time. It will involve working together with those communities across Scotland. And as the Cabinet Secretary has said, as, as he has said, and it will have to be in a sensitive and a culturally acceptable way and involving all the many statutory and third sector organisations involved in protecting the very vulnerable girls and women who may be at risk of violation by those of their compatriots who are willing to carry out FGM. But action must not stop at protecting those at risk. And a number of members have mentioned this. The message must also go out to the perpetrators of the crime of FGM that their practice is illegal and will be punished. These people need to be found and dealt with by the courts and to achieve this, Police Scotland must be supported to bring forward pr pr prosecutions as a deterrent to those who persist in carrying out such barbaric procedures in violation of their victims' human rights. So, Presiding Officer, I commend the Government's motion and the amendment in the name of Ken McIntosh, both of which, of course, will support at decision time. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Rhoda Grant. Ms Grant, eight minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this debate is timely and welcome, coming as it does um, the day before the United Nations Day of Zero Tolerance to Female Genital Mutilation. And I think the whole chamber has united around condemning this barbaric act. 
It's been sometimes a difficult debate, sometimes a very moving debate, um, but I think many people have agreed that we need um, to continue the good work that has been ongoing previously to make sure that we outlaw this barbaric act. Our amendment uh, seeks to be helpful rather than critical, and I think many of our speakers today have pointed that out. But um, I think it is also important, and some speakers have suggested that maybe it wasn't important, but I believe it is. So let me just take a moment um, to, to explain why we felt the need to put it down and what it actually means. We welcome that the Scottish Government funds information initiatives and the like, but our amendment is asking them to review how this funding is used and indeed its impact. Would it be more effective to use the funding to equip and build community groups, some of which are already on place, which could then be used as a vehicle to engage and inform with the communities involved? They build trust and are able to put across messages and reinforce them in a way that one-off events eh, cannot. And Hanzal Malik eh, made the point that FGM is a taboo subject and often a one-off meeting to discuss it is unlikely to attract the target group of people you want to influence. However, if this information is delivered through a trusted grassroots community group, it's much more likely to gain traction. And these vehicles can also be used to deliver other information on different issues as well. And that's not to say that good work is not already going on in the Women's Support Project, the Refugee Council, the like that have been mentioned um, in the debate today are doing excellent work, but we need to create and sustain grassroots organisations for women within those vulnerable communities. And um, John Finney made the point in his speech that interventions need to be by the community rather than be to them by outside groups. And if we build that community resilience and use that to change and influence cultural norms, that can also mean that more children at risk will be reported and protected. And Patricia Ferguson made also a really good point about um, to build that support that's critical within the communities, because if we're successful, and we all hope we will be, in providing and changing that cultural um, norm, there needs to be support within the community, trusted support, to provide indeed the medical and emotional interventions that those people will need. And all our amendment is actually doing is asking the Cabinet Secretary to review how we put those messages out and indeed to look at adopting best practice. So rather than being critical, we are being helpful. The only point I think that is ever so slightly contentious in the debate today is about child protection. And I truly believe that every girl born in Scotland to a woman who has undergone FGM should be considered a child at risk. FGM is violence against women and girls and it must be tackled as such and a child at risk has to be protected. When a mother has been abused in this way and gives birth to a girl, we must see that as a sign that protection is required. It must be recognised that the mother has already faced abuse and her daughter is now at risk. Support and protection must be given in a way that recognises the trauma of the mother, and I think a number of speakers made that point, and also the pressure she will be under from within her community to have the same procedure carried out for her daughter. She herself may require medical intervention, both physically and mentally, and that might be the case before the birth. Um, and this has to be delivered in a way that is sensitive to our needs. And I think uh, Christina McKelvey made the point that it has to be non-stigmatising, non-judgmental and supportive. However, if you've suffered abuse yourself, it's not a defence against perpetrating that abuse against your child. So while we're supporting the mother, we have to protect the child. And I think Patricia Ferguson also talked about um, the BMA and their concerns about mandatory reporting. If a child had arrived at the GPs covered in bruises, they would have no, uh, no thought about not reporting that issue. We must take the same zero tolerance approach to FGM to protect children in the future. A number of speakers spoke about the health implications for women, and I don't think anyone could help but be moved um, by the very stark speech that Margaret McCulloch made when she went through all the different forms of FGM, but also the impact that has on people into the future, and the problems indeed that um, women face giving birth that can lead to, the, to complications for them 
and their child and many children dying and because of the, the complications and problems that can occur. And indeed, for many women, um, natural childbirth is absolutely impossible. So I think we need to look at how we address the implications and problems of FGM that has already been carried out in our mature population. A number of people have talked about the legislation that has been in place for many, many, many years, and there has not been, until very recently, a single prosecution, certainly within the UK, and the most recent one um, we all heard has, has failed. Um, this is probably because of the nature of FGM um, and, and because it is so hidden. We're not being critical of the police because they need information from other agencies and indeed the public to allow them to intervene. But if we say that in 2012, 363 children were born at risk of FGM, and yet there was only 25 police in investigations, we know that we are not catching an awful lot of people. It could be that child protection is in place and working, but I don't think we can, we can, we can demonstrate that in any way. So we need to know what is happening. Um, because this practice is secret, it's not reporting, and therefore we, that is where our disappointment lies, not with actually the police and the authorities that should be prosecuting this. Um, John Mason talked about approaches in other countries, and indeed the need to target the countries where this is culturally acceptable, and I think if we change that, we can actually make a change to the people who are moving to our country if they believe it's unacceptable at home. So this is not just an issue for ourselves. It requires community change on a much greater scale. A number of speakers talked about cultural differences and services available to women. Um, I would add to that that they should be staffed, some of those services for women should be staffed by women as well, recognising cultural concerns. We also need more training. The case that fell yesterday was because of a lack of training for medics. All frontline staff, as been said by a number of speakers, should be trained um, on how to deal with this and to make sure that women... Uh, appearing at health services are given the proper support that they require and the same with publicity. Um, presiding officer, just to close, this is not a religious practice, it's about controlling women's sexuality. While women practice FM, FGM, um, the pressure is often exercised by men and the wider society. Men expect purified brides. And this, this practice makes sexual contact painful and difficult and therefore ensures ch chastity. It's violence against women and girls. It's controlling and a barbaric practice. Thank you. I now call on Alex Neal to wind up the de debate. Cabinet Secretary, till five o'clock, please. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. Can I say this has been a very, very good debate. I think every speech has been a very good speech indeed. Uh, but I would like in particular to pay tribute to the convener of the Equal Opportunities Committee, Margaret McCulloch, both for her speech and for her commitment uh, to this whole subject as convener of the Equal Opportunities Committee. And I know the entire committee are in agreement about giving this issue a priority, which it obviously deserves. Can I also welcome the four ladies in the gallery who have been sitting uh, listening to the entire debate. They're all from the third sector organisations dealing with this issue, and I hope that uh, they will feel that there's a clear message from the parliament and indeed from every side of the chamber uh, that we are all determined to tackle this issue and tackle it head on. Can I say at the core of the debate, I think there is a cross-party consensus that the way to tackle this, as, as John Finney put it, is to work with the communities, not to tell the communities, and as Hansel, Hamlin, Hansel did as well, this is about working with the communities, enabling them, uh, empowering them to deal with this issue. And John Mason made the point about the tremendous progress that's been made, particularly in Kenya, uh, where the levels and incidence of FMG has been substantially reduced, not just in recent years, actually over a sustained period of decades. And if you look at the history of how Kenya has managed to make that progress, is by following this very strategy, because the demand for change was generated from within the communities in Kenya. It wasn't imposed on them. And indeed, as John said, when, uh, as it were, white settlers went out and tried to impose a solution, that was counterproductive. And I think we can learn a lot 
from what's actually happened in Kenya over the years as to what we should actually be doing in Scotland and what the successful strategy has at its core. Can I also say that I, I although it didn't get a lot of mention after my mention of it in my speech, uh, that I think the Short Life Working Group has a big role to play in taking forward this agenda and in advising the whole Parliament about how we take forward the SRC report and recommendations, but also how we take forward some of the other issues that were raised in this debate. For example, Tricia Ferguson raised the issue of mandatory reporting. It is actually a legal requirement at the moment that if anyone is aware of FNG taking place, they are legally obliged to report it. But why it's not being reported is one of the issues that I think legitimately the Short Life Working Group should be able to address, as well as this issue of why, in all the time that this has been illegal in Scotland, why there have been no prosecutions, and what can we do to rectify that situation. Let me just say a word or two more about the remit and the objectives of the Short Life Working Group. There are essentially four parts to the remit. Part one is to review work currently underway across different sectors in Scotland to tackle FGM. And that will include, but not exclusively include, health, education, justice, social work, local authorities, communities, and the third sector. Second part of the remit is to identify and agree what more needs to be done, taking into account the recommendations, as I said, of the intercollegiate report tackling FGM in the UK and the recommendations from the SRC research project. Thirdly, to agree actions on how progress and success can be measured. And fourthly, to facilitate the work required, including the implementation of any new legislation to protect those at risk of FGM. Now, I'm expecting that a short life working group to report during 2015, presiding officer. And I think once we have that report from the short life working group, before the government makes any final decisions on what to do about its recommendations, I would be keen to come back to Parliament and for us to have another full-scale debate, this time on the, on the very subject of the report and the recommendations from the Short Life Working Group, because I think if we can move forward together on its recommendations and conclusions on a cross-party consensual basis, then that will send a very loud and clear message about the determination right across this chamber to not only take this issue seriously, but actually to do something about it and to adopt any ambitious proposals that come forward. Can I also say that we are cooperating very much with the UK government uh, because there is a loophole at a UK level in terms of the legislation. As everybody in here knows and many people have remarked, FGM became unlawful in Scotland in 1985 and it's punishable by up to 14 years in prison. My officials have further cooperated with those in Westminster to close a loophole in the law on the, in relation to the uh, success uh, of the prohibition of female genital mutilation Scotland Act 2005. And the, this change that will come into effect later this year will extend the reach of the extraterritorial offences in the Act to ensure that a person who is not a permanent UK resident will still be triable in the Scottish courts. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's suddenly going to lead to a massive increase in the number of prosecutions, but I think everybody in the chamber will agree that the right thing for us to do is to cooperate with our friends at Westminster to close this particular loophole. But let me just say a word or two about prosecutions and the legality. Only last week, a doctor in Egypt was convicted uh, for practicing FGM. And as we know, there has been a case yesterday where uh, an accused was found not guilty uh, south of the border. But other than that, there have been no prosecutions across the UK. But while there have been no prosecutions in Scotland, let me make it absolutely clear and beyond any doubt that anyone, as I've said, who's aware of M FGM taking place has a legal as well as a moral duty to report it. There is never, ever an, an excuse for this kind of abuse. 
Those at risk will, will be protected and those who choose to perpetrate these crimes will rightly face the full force of the law for their actions. And has already been mentioned in the debate, Police Scotland has now got a very proactive agenda on trying to seek out where FGM is taking place and working with the communities on this matter. The police have also made it absolutely clear that they will investigate all reported incidents uh, and that there is strong legislation in place to prosecute in cases of FGM. Anyone aiding or carrying out FGM, either here or abroad, as I say, faces the prospect of up to 14 years imprisonment. And maybe one of the things we need to do is to make it more generally known in the relevant communities that anyone who is found uh, of being guilty of these offences could face that length of prison sentence. I would hope the knowledge of that would be a deterrent to those who are still practising FGM in Scotland. Now, let me say we don't underestimate how difficult it is for someone from a practising community to come forward. If it was easy, people are more likely to come forward and there would have already probably have been prosecutions. The fact that there have been no prosecutions does tell us that it is very difficult. And that makes the work, our work in raising awareness uh, and bringing about attitudinal change by working with these communities all the more important. Because if in the first place we can persuade people that FGM is the wrong thing to do in principle, then the issue of prosecutions wouldn't arise in the first place. And certainly in my discussions this morning with DAF, one of the key lessons that I learned from that is the need to work particularly with the young women in these communities and the young men to change attitudes and get the cultural change we need. Presiding officer, let me make it absolutely clear, as the First Minister has already done, that we will take this issue and are taking this issue very seriously and we will take forward the agenda when the Short Life Working Group reports this year, we will come back to Parliament and we will seek joint agreement across the Parliament for any additional action that is recommended because we are determined as a Parliament as well as a government to eliminate FGM from the face of Scottish society. Thank you. That concludes the debate on working partnership to end the practice of female genital immunity. We now move to the next item of business, which is decision time. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is motion number 12242 in the name of John Swinney on the Local Government Finance Scotland Order 2015 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cancel the votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12242 in the name of John Swinney is as follows. Yes, 99. No, 2. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 12241.1 in the name of Ken McIntosh, which seeks to amend motion number 12241 in the name of Alex Neal on ending the practice of female genital mutilation be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is motion number 12241 in the name of Alex Neal as amended on ending the practice of female genital mutilation be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. I now close this meeting. <laughs>